everything is ready, my darling. Do not be afraid. We will be together again. This is all the whiskey you possess? <laughs> you should believe in ghosts, pea brain. He's a closet! He's a closet! He's a closet! Hello and welcome to Hello, This is the Doom Show. I am Richard. Folks, this is episode 200. I don't know how we got to episode 200. That doesn't make any sense. In case you're just tuning in, here's what you missed. Hi, Kathy Mitchell here with my new Dump Cake Cookbook. It's as simple as dump and bake. Richard lives in Penis, Alabama. We're just friends. <laughs> Nobody's just friends with a belly dancer. You're sure you're not a jointleman? Uh, not at the moment, no, it's a bit early. <laughs> not putting my green sweater until later, until it gets dark. <laughs> There's also a cop named Richard, but we'll get to him later. I just love when there's people named me in a movie. Yeah, it's because you're a narcissist. Oh. He's like one of our best actors. I, like he's I, one of America's <laughs> treasures. He's Canadian. He's one of Canada's treasures. <laughs> <laughs> It's a cockroach. <laughs> Halloween. Is your name Eugene? It's possible. It's possible. Destination That's the whole mantra of Jello Jello. Who moved the tombstone? <laughs> The Mole and Baba, Mo better. Watching Hal Holbrook solving the case is like watching a baby eat puzzle pieces. Yeah. But we forgot to mention, I think, she turns into a fucking draw pull. A what? A draw pull. What is that? You know, like, um, I've got a drawer here, I'm opening it. Oh, a drawer pull. You know, I'm thing sorry. you to. Your accent got me. Uh, we, we say drawer pull. Don't hurt me, please! Don't keep me waiting for those! Yo quiero Taco Bell. <laughs> a boner of tears. <laughs> I'm happy to be an American, a land of happy razzmatazz. It's called production value, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> now I know. So where did all this start anyway? Back in May of 2011, specifically May 9th, 2011, my co-host Brad and I uh, unleashed the first episode of Hello, This is the Doom Show. We talked about what everyone talks about on their first episode, the dead are alive, the bonkers giallo that I think you're tired of hearing about from all those other shows. Uh, once upon a time, Brad and I were going to do an episode where we kind of revisited our first episode and talked about it, and then we found out that our first episode was, in fact, unlistenable. But hey, I want to turn back the clock and listen to prime, hot, 2011 Brad and Richard. So here's just a little snippet of the beginning of Hello, This is the Doom Show, episode number one. Hello, and welcome to Hello, This is the Doom Show. I am Richard. I am Brad. And we are here today on our very first episode. So, if this, like, completely sucks, we'll have really good excuses. We'll do better. But, like, you know, three episodes from now, we'll have to stop using those excuses. Those excuses. Well, we'll just put the, the blame squarely at my feet. Brad, stop it! I mean, Sorry. stop. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, that wasn't too painful now, was it? Yowza! So eventually, uh, we weren't just two people. Uh, Our pal Jeffrey joined the show to cover when Brad couldn't be there because of work. And then, uh, eventually, my buddy Nafa joined the show, too. And sadly, Nafa passed away three years ago, and I had to retire the amazing Hello, This Is The Doom Show theme song by one Matt Farley of Moturn Media. Because he mentions Nafa by name in the intro, it seemed kind of weird. So here's the beautiful music from Matt Farley doing the classic song called Hello, This Is The Doom Show. Hello, hello, this is the Doom Show, Richard Brand. Jeffrey Nafa, it's the Doom Show. Hello, hello, this is the Doom Show. Slashers, G.I. Low and Horror, it's the Doom Show. The cuckoo clock interrupts the show. Doomed move it on. Death of the old salesman. Sweaty Cameron Mitchell. Well, we felt that something was missing after Nafa's passing, and of course, no one could fill his very unique shoes. There was no one on the planet anything like Nafa. So, we asked our pal Simon, a friend of the show, and just an all-around great guy, if he'd be interested in becoming one of the permanent hosts on Hello, This is the Doom Show. And he did. He accepted. So, we welcomed Simon as part of our, our crew Our badass gang brother. And somewhere in this very confusing, convoluted history of this podcast, we were asked to join Legion Podcasts, the Legion Legion Podcast Podcast Network. And we were very honored because we were now shoulder to shoulder with some really incredible shows, some really talented podcasters. Huge thanks to them. Uh, We were able to reach a much wider audience and we've made so many cool friends with our sister shows on the network. So everything's coming up, broses. But you're probably wondering, what the hell are you doing on episode 200? What in the living gosh is going to occur on this spectacular celebration, dude? Duder? Well, uh, I have reached out to the audience of Hello, This is the Doom Show. And you guys sent us some questions, some top 10 lists some voicemails, and we're going to get to all of that and cover all of your content that you thought would be a good idea to ask about. Now you're going to regret it because mainly my voice, my awful personality, the only thing keeping this show afloat is my awesome co-hosts. Speaking of awesome co-hosts, let's introduce our, our crew here. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to introduce a multifaceted, multi-sided person, a human with so many uh, sides. It's Simon. Welcome, Simon, to episode 200. Hello. Uh, I was a little distracted. (laughs) I had a cat walking across me as I was just talking. So if you hear purring, it's from me. (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and also men, Give a warm episode 200. Thank you before he says anything, and welcome to Jeffrey. Jeffrey! Uh, I expect 200 rounds of applause, and I will wait. (laughs) You want to hear 200 claps each person? No, I want full rounds of applause. Yeah, so 200, like, that's a good round of applause number. And then stop, and then start up again. (laughs) So it'll be a while, but I have time. Nice. Very nice. Uh, I wouldn't want it any other way. (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, he has been described as the meat, potatoes, and kielbasa of Hello, This is the Doom Show. He's also my favorite man. It's Brad. Hello, Brad. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Welcome to the episode 200th. Oh, man, it's amazing. 200. <laughs> it only took us nine years to get here. Well. 
I said took us. First email comes from AJ Anderson Yakovich. I apologize if I'm butchering your name, AJ. He says, Hello to Hello, This is the Doom Show. I've already written in with some super effin' fun lists for the super 200th episode, but figured I'd write in a little appreciation of the fellas and Lietta on occasion. First off, me and some buds started a podcast last year called Slob Cinema, and in my mind, Hello, This is the Doom Show, played a pivotal role in giving me the drive to finally share my my morbid movie permersion. <laughs> my morbid... That's a tongue twister. My morbid movie perversions onto the world. Single-handedly, I have two hands though, and I think all of you do too? Hello, This is the Doom Show has really amped up my delve into the pits of H-E double hockey sticks with mind-blowing first views on the show's recommendation, including... Uh, Murder Obsession, Moi, Matango, Home Improvement Grunt, <laughs> Dead and Buried, Fuck This, I'm Googling Sandwiches, Zader, <laughs> Nice Anniversary Present, Bitch, and Monster Dog, It Stinks. Anyways, I ramble. To Rick Deckard Richard, Brad Biff Tannen, Jeffrey Giallo Meister, Scott Sabata Rojo, and Simon Simpatico Sophistico. Thanks. AJ would like to know. What are your top five sleazy films? Right. So, uh, yeah, firstly, before I get into that, I just want to thank him for these um, amazing nicknames he's given us. And I'm going to have to change my <laughs> nickname to this, I think, on Messenger or something. So you've given me Simon Simpatico Sophistico. So uh, <laughs> thank you for that, AJ. I, uh, I love it. Uh, so top five sleazy films. These, uh, unlike the following lists, aren't really in any order. Uh, first two, though, are kind of related. So I think they're both, uh, Andrea Bianchi, Bianchi, however you say it, um, got Strip Nude for Your Killer and Burial Ground. Then we've got, uh, The New York Ripper, which could also appear on at least one more of these, uh, coming lists. Same with the, uh, the next film, which is Delirium. Photos of Joya, is it? <laughs> And last but not least, uh, Body Double. Ooh, good choices. Right, uh, you. you and I did have a, a choice in common there. I also have a Burial Ground on my list. Fantastic. Which is funny because it's all the sleaziness is just down to two characters, <laughs> but they bring it so completely. Oh, man. It's uh, like a kind of mic drop of sleaze that, you know. <laughs> yes. AJ would like to know. What are your top five sleazy films? Well, this was an interesting question for me because I think that my um, sleaze dar is uh, <laughs> malfunctioning. <laughs> um, like I think I looked up a, a list. I found this very long list on Mubi um, of sleazy movies because I was just curious to, to know what other people thought sleazy movies were, and they were putting like what I thought were like straight up art films on there like yeah is solo a sleazy movie are any of jean roland's movies sleazy no not at all so i had to think about this and think about what what i thought was sleazy and uh i guess sleazy for me also has a dash of trash so these are movies that are like they make you feel dirty <laughs> like you've just been like wall you you've been oscar the grouching Ew. Um, yeah. Well, no, it's good though. Cause you enjoy oh. it like, like Oscar does. So my top sleazy movie, I, I think I put more than five here. Cause I mean, I can't be stopped. Go for uh, it. my favorite of all time sleazy movie is scream for help. Are you familiar with this one, Richard? Yes. Oh yeah. my God. That movie's so weird. Relentlessly sleazy. I, I don't even want to say why exactly, because I feel like anything I could say would be a, a spoiler, but it's like, to sum it up, if you have not seen it, this movie is <laughs> if if Nancy Drew had like all of the venereal diseases. That's how I would describe wow. it. Like Holy not shit. not Nancy Drew herself, but like the like a, you're carrying a book of hers, and it's just got like all the venereal diseases. <laughs> so not her, just the book. No, no, no. Nancy Drew is a wonderful lady. Um, wash wash your books, people. Wash your books. Uh, some others. This one is borderline. Whereas I do feel like it is a, a, a wonderful piece of art, but yeah, it's trashy. Um, good luck, Miss Wyckoff. You heard of this one? I have not heard of that one. Well, uh, this was one of the early Vinegar Syndrome releases. And I want to look up who wrote it. I believe it was written by a famous playwright, if I'm not mistaken. 
Yeah, uh, he wrote Picnic. His name is uh, William Inge. Hmm. Um, this is a movie that is, uh, whoa, boy, is it trashy. It's described <laughs> on uh, the Google results as a drama, and it is certainly a drama of one kind or another. It is about uh, interracial love uh, set in a school. Uh, Donald Pleasance is in it. Uh, the main star is Anne Haywood. It oh, is. Boy. I don't feel like the material itself would be necessarily super sleazy on its own, but the way that it is actually made by our wonderful director, Marvin J. Chomsky, who is responsible for, I, I have no idea what else. Uh, <laughs> although he, um, uh, oh, I guess he was one of the directors for the miniseries Roots. Well, that's really interesting when you see this movie. Uh, <laughs> Uh, he also went to Sy- he graduated from Syracuse University. That's uh that's my hometown. Oh my god, he's the he's the cousin of Noam Chomsky. Oh, so much. I should have done some what more research about this. What is happening here? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> see, good luck, Miss Wyckoff. Highly recommended. Okay. Um, some others that are are kind. Uh, here's a triptych of uh, recommendations that are I think closely related in some way. Um, Vice Squad, Ten to Midnight, and Fear City. Um, oh, wow. These are all I would say like horror crime hybrids they they edge more towards the crime but they all have like serial killers that make him kind of you know i think horror horror adjacent um and they're all super super duper sleazy i guess my definition of <laughs> of of sleazy is is it set in new york city in like the 70s or the 80s well it's sleazy then <laughs> uh <laughs> two others uh last house on dead end street oh, which wow. is the sleaziest of all of the like uh, i guess like cult killer hippie movies love it one that is going to to jump over into our uh uh one of our our next questions uh, i generally don't feel like the works of jess franco are all that sleazy i know that makes me strange but <laughs> one of his S- sadomania is extremely sleazy i can't even defend that uh but i love it Uh, (laughs) so those are my picks we have one title in common i would uh vice squad that actually is uh one that i enjoyed yes nice i had to uh i mean this is totally by chance i picked it up um at a used movie store used movie and music store on laser disc it was oh, wow. the Japanese laser disc of Vice oh, very, Squad. That's awesome. <laughs> it had a huge scratch on it, but I managed because I got it for a dollar, maybe three nine two ninety nine or something. I managed to get it to play, record onto a DVD burner, and of course had the Japanese subtitles through the whole thing. Because what country loves American sleaze more than any other? Yeah. <laughs> That'd be Japan. So what what happens uh, when a laser disc has a scratch on it? Like what? It's it's exactly like if a uh, scratch is on a DVD. You can try to skip the chapter, mm. and you might get it to play. And I actually did get it to play all the way to the end, but there was a section, maybe about three minutes long, I could not get. Oh, so it was very funny. frustrating. I mean, that's uh, just was, a nice aesthetic object beyond, you know, yes, its playability. Exactly. <laughs> oh, I've held on to it. I have held on to it. The other laser discs weren't as interesting as that one. That's the best one. Uh, the other good laser disc I had was Intruder. That was a cool one. But of course, oh, it was the nice. the trimmed. It wasn't uncut. It was so obviously censored. But it was neat. I sold it for a lot of money. There's a uh, there's a Salvation Army um, in the next town over from me where I work that no longer uh, sells VHS tapes. They like refuse them, but they have a gigantic selection of laser discs. <laughs> I think that they think they're vinyl records. <laughs> oh my god, that's so cute! That's so cute. I I still have a working laser disc player stashed at work. Wow. I will not get rid of it until they you know make me. Now, Brad, I know you're a big sleazy guy. What are your favorite sleazy films? Uh, I've got one, and it is In the Folds of the Flesh. Oh, oh man. It certainly has the sleaziest title of ever made. And ever made? Uh-huh. <laughs> I forgot how talk good. <laughs> I, I will say this. That was not on my list, but that is a fine film. I would love to have a person who doesn't know me that well come over and put that on and not say anything. You know what right. I mean? Just, be like, just act like, mm-hmm. oh, no, this is a very normal movie, and just throw it on. There you go. And, and then they'd never speak to you again. 
<laughs> ever. <laughs> so my top five sleazy films. This is a tough topic because I, you know, my tastes have changed. I'm less likely to seek out sleaziness. A lot of times when I was seeking out sleaziness, it was just out of desperation to find more horror. And you can't find more horror without like some really trashy stuff. So here's my list that took me a very long time to think up of uh, five sleazy films. So here we go. Uh, the House on the Edge of the Park. I don't know what it is about that movie. I just love it. When you watch it or when I watch it, I'm like, why? Why do I even own this piece of trash? But man, it's just something about it. Visitor Q from uh, Takashi Miike or Takashi or Takashi Miike. I always forget how to say his name. Visitor Q is disgusting and weird and wonderful. Uh, I think if it didn't have a happy ending, spoiler alert, I probably wouldn't love it. But man, it's something. Good old Vice Squad. Yeah, Vice Squad. I don't know. Frickin' Wings Hauser being really creepy and really just gross. It's a, it's a grubby little movie. The Killer Has Reserved Nine Seats. Uh, a giallo with genital mutilation for some reason. Maybe punishing lesbian characters. That, that ain't right. That's, that's, that's bad. Uh, but it also has incest. <laughs> in case you didn't, uh, have enough trash in this frickin' movie. Uh, It's got drugs in it, and the killer's weird looking. So yeah, great stuff. Speaking of incest, uh, Burial Ground, The Knights of Terror. Uh, Not a sleazy movie all the way through, but there's two characters in it that make the whole thing sleazy. So uh, he would also like to know uh, about your your favorite Jess Franco films. Oh boy. Well, I nearly got carried away with this. So I've done a top five. Then I started uh, earlier today trying to expand it to a top 10. Then I just gave up because it would just get a bit crazy. But uh, before that, um, I just want to say again, thank you, Tim, for um, inspiring a double feature last night. Um, ooh. 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 <laughs> firstly, uh, a film I'd never seen, which was recently uploaded by the, I think it was some kind of Spanish film institute. And then it was kind of um, taken down the same day, but I, I managed to... Um, so some like video conversion websites, you know, you can grab YouTube videos with and stuff. <gasps> uh, I managed. You to, would uh... never, you would never <laughs> use something like that. He's kidding, folks. Me oh, but of course. Oh, I no. did the well... same thing. I did the same thing, but I wouldn't. <laughs> Joking aside, of course. Uh, I I imagine it's not commercially available, so I think we're, uh, you know, it's perfectly kosher. <laughs> as far as I'm aware, you know, just uh, d- disclaimer there. Uh, so that was <laughs> called uh, What a Honeymoon. I think the title translates as. And uh, I was, uh, to be honest, at first I was kind of struggling to get into a bit. I think so my mood's just been, um, you may have said, or other folks may have said on this, to kind of give a um, kind of peek behind the curtain and make this into a bit of a time capsule. You know, we're um, kind of all under lockdown and all this just complete uh, unprecedented mind-fucking weirdness at the moment. So, uh, yeah, my mood, like many other people's, has been you know, really up and down so yeah i was struggling to get into it a bit at first but uh I, you know later on uh when i'd kind of acclimatized i, I was loving it as i think i um uh, i said somewhere um it kind of reminded me a little bit of kiss me monster you know in the Ooh. um the sense that it's all driven by this kind of ridiculous MacGuffin, and it's got this kind of revolving door of uh crazy characters but uh yeah just real kind of you know nice summary bright and breezy uh Man. you know farcical film so i would recommend that and uh, my top five, so a lot of these could be interchangeable, and you know, so many honourable mentions here that I'm not even going to start to get into. Uh, number five, Venus in Furs. Yes. Number four, Kiss Me Monster, which I just mentioned, of course. Hell yeah. And again, oh, you know, like I say, when I was doing these lists before, I had to give up in the end. Cause you, you know me, I'm prone to kind of chronically overthinking things. Uh, to put it mildly, and I just had to go, right, no, we'll leave it. Because, yeah, as we've said before, lists can change really minute by minute, second by second. Anyway, I digress. Um, number three, <laughs> like I do that, uh, Rice of Frankenstein. Yes. Or, you nice. know, the, uh, erotic rights, you know, whichever's fine. I, uh, you know. Uh, and uh, number two, A Virgin Among the Living Dead. Nice. Uh, number one, the first one I saw, which I uh, followed What Honeymoon with last night. Uh, and holy shit, I just noticed, um, I just noticed a really obvious link there. You know, obviously they've both got moon in the title. I, that never hit me last night. That's awesome. Oh, shit. Yeah, man, uh, synchronicities abound. 
Uh, excuse wow. me, it's called yeah. the Simonicity. Oh, I, I I beg your pardon, but of course, yeah, that that needs to go in the new new edition of the Oxford English D- Dictionary. Or what, what's your uh, standard over there? Is it Merriam-Webster or something like that? If it's not in next year, we'll we'll all be very very angry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we've got to thank uh, thank Brad for coining that one. So yeah, um, Bloody Moon, and uh, yeah, it also because what a honeymoon. I think it was shot the year before, it, so probably very pretty much contemporary to uh, Bloody Moon. The um, Place where, you know, that swimming pool that features a lot in Bloody Moon, uh, whatever right. it is, some kind of hotel or something. You see that a few times in there. And oh, some wow. Of the, and, and as you know, you know, Jess Franco, he liked to, you know, kind of on the sly when he was shooting one film, he'd be kind of shooting, you know, two or three other ones, wouldn't it? Always, yep. So uh, Bloody Moon, you know, uh, that uh, regrettable um, snake scene aside that, uh, oh. you know, will always, <laughs> will, uh, always remain my number one, I think. Nice. We did have two in common. Uh, my list contained Kiss Me Monster. Awesome. And A Virgin Among the Living Dead. Fantastic. Yeah. Very nice. Favorite Jess Franco films. Now, here's the thing. I feel like my Jess Franco film selections are fairly vanilla. I mean, I guess they're not like... Well, call them French vanilla. You know, they got they got a little <laughs> bit of a, of, a, of a spice to them. Um, my favorite... I, I, I waffle. I've got three that I would say are my top favorites. Um, which one is my favorite varies. Um, at the moment, I'm going to say Lorna the Exorcist is my favorite. Nice. Though the other two are uh, Eugenie de Sade and yeah. Virgin Among the Living Dead. Oh, yeah. Those are my top three. I think they're all of a piece. They are certainly his most sort of like melancholic, uh, <laughs> sexy movies, <laughs> sexy horror adjacent movies. I think Eugenie Desaad is probably the most competent of them, but I do actually find Lorna of the Exorcist and Virgin Among the Living Dead like emotionally affecting, particularly Virgin Among the Living Dead. I don't know why, like that image of, of, uh, the hanged Howard Vernon just sort of like floating along, like brings tears to my eyes. Oh, um, man. The other two in my list of uh, five, which I've decided to go with five, uh, would be Bloody Moon, which we've covered nice. on the show. I love Bloody Moon. I mean, in terms of the the less uh, <laughs> uh, the less serious, less meaty Jess Franco films, uh, you can't go wrong with Bloody Moon. <laughs> um, and then uh, one of his more outre pieces, Succubus. Uh, yes. which uh, is also uh, uh, counts among its admirers Fritz Long. Uh, Fritz Long really likes Succubus. <laughs> that's incredible. Yeah, so that's a good one. Uh, we had uh, uh, two in common. We had uh, Eugenie de Sade, which is my favorite, and a version of the Among the Living Dead, which is another big favorite for me. I love it. Uh, Lorna probably has a few too many like crotch shots for you, right? Yeah, I did not enjoy it. Although <laughs> I, I'm so broken from watching like 50 plus Jess Franco movies for over however many years that I probably will love it now. Like I'm still working my way up to uh, Mansion of the Living Dead. Oh, it's good. I, I'm working on I'm going to get there. You'll see that on a Franco Friday. Someday I'll be brave enough. I feel like I've told you at one point you need to watch it. I mean... A couple times now. Have yes, you, I... Lena Romay just eating dog food for, like, the entire movie? Beautiful. I think it was the puking girl. The girl who's, like, covered in her vomit. I think that was where I was like, I'm out, but I, I think I can handle it now. Yeah, it's really good. That's relatable to me. <laughs> so... <laughs> That's what I see when I look in the mirror. <laughs> Talk about some of your favorite Jess Francos. All right, so I made a list of five. Eugenie de Sade, oh, yeah. which is the Eugenie with Solid Admiranda. No, her name is uh, Stephen McLusky or McClunky. McClunky. <laughs> McClunky. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's that one, the one where she's the stepdaughter and Paul Muller, Mueller is her stepfather. Oh, man, that's on my list. Then there is A Virgin Among the Living Dead. Yes. Night of the Skull. Oh, I had a feeling that would be on your list. Mm Mm-hmm. Silence of the Tombs, (gasps) which is a Montserrat Prue, who I often like to say is uh, Franco's forgotten muse. Yeah, nobody talks about her. No. And then another one with her, which is Martin Luther Presley's favorite Franco film, The Sinister Eyes of Dr. Orloff. (laughs) Oh, shit, dude. That's great. 
a, like a very specific era of Franco, which is like 70 to 74, where he made about 700 films in that four year period. <laughs> so you've got plenty to choose from. I could never have a marathon of Franco films, I don't think, because it would just be too much in, to, to me. But I love him when you're watching one or two films. And I've got a lot of friends that just absolutely adore him. Yeah, I found, thanks to that uh, Stephen Thrower book, uh, because the volume one was out of print, I bought volume two, not thinking I'd be that into it. But of course, the story behind his period of films that's my least favorite is fascinating but interesting i ain't gonna watch the pornos because i'm just not into it it's not no i'm uh i'm a neuter like that movie that john waters movie with the neuters those are my Uh those are my people i've probably told this story before but i did a franco friday you you graciously allowed me to do one yes (laughs) and you said well here's you know here's some you could pick and i picked one and you said well there's uh there's some pretty hardcore sex I've heard in this one. And uh, it was like, I don't know, like an hour and 23 minutes or something. And I get down to like an hour 20 and I'm like, well, Richard's information was, you know, it's false information. And then bam. <laughs> like, okay. Didn't move the plot forward at all, you know. And I'm not a prude. What was it? I'm just, yeah, it was just right there at the tail end. Was it the climax of the movie? <laughs> Close to it, yeah. <laughs> oh, and man. I can't even remember. I can't even remember which one it was. I really enjoyed it. It probably should have made my list. I, I, but I want to say it uh, was How to Seduce a Virgin. No, 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 that wasn't it. Maybe I did that one. Well, a true friend would have been like, "Hey, Brad, want to do a Franco Friday?" You'd be like, "Yeah, what should I cover?" I would. I should have said anything you want, even if I've already covered it. That's what friends do. <laughs> but I was like, well, I need more titles. I need to cover these titles. Well, I did another one that was uh, the de- the Devil's Ding Dong. <laughs> Hold on, I gotta look that up. The Devil's Ding Dong was definitely what it was uh, called. Yeah, it was uh, the, the guy had big bulging hairy eyes. It was awful. I mean, the 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 thing was awful. Let's see. The, but, uh, the blog will tell all. Rockhead was in it. Al Cliver. Oh, Rockhead. Let's it's like see. 82, 81, 82, maybe. I'm scrolling. You, you've contributed a lot to this blog, man. I tried. Oh, look at that. Look at that. Look at that. Okay, that didn't work at all. Let's try doing Franco Friday Brad. Okay, so the, the, the one you did that wasn't the one we're talking about, but the previous one was Tender uh-huh. and Perverse Emmanuel. That's it, yeah. I could not remember the title either. No, I couldn't either. And you also did... The Devil's Ding Dong. (laughs) The Dong Hunter. No, it was The Devil Hunter. There you go. Yep. Oh my God, that movie. Yeah. Well, I like Bloody Moon, too. Oh, yeah. It's a little little out of... uh, I really like that 70 to 74 period. Telling you, that's my jam, too. Yeah. Now, in his movies, uh, when I do like a marathon of his stuff... I'm not going to watch a bunch of his unseen things. I'm only going to stick to proven Franco material for my taste. So, yeah, I'm not going to go uh, far beyond 74. Yeah, like uh, the last Franco film I watched, David Ladd sent me a copy of oh, The Other, Other Side, Side of, of the, the Mirror. mirror. Yes. Yeah. And that's been at least... We watched that in the apartment, and we've been in the house two years. Oh, man. So, so that's been... Probably three years ago. That's a great movie. It's not that I don't love him. I do. I, you know, I have very specific films that I really do enjoy. It's just, I don't know, that aesthetic is is not one that I can just, you know, I could throw on and watch five Fulci films in a row or five Argentos or five right. Babas. Because I know that uh, he's David Ladd's favorite uh, yeah. director. And I want to say, I think he's Amy Green's favorite director, too. Yes. For every one Franco movie that you watch, Amy Green has watched 16. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And she's not even seen like half his filmography <laughs> at that rate. <laughs> even he, even in his lifetime, Franco hadn't seen his, that many. No, it's true. You're right. It's a shame he died before he could see them all. <laughs>
Uh, also, A Virgin Among the Living Dead was also on my list, if I didn't say. Oh, nice. Fantastic. Nice, nice. Well, I know Eugenie Desaad was, surely. Yeah, that's my that's my favorite. That's my favorite. Uh-huh, mine too. Oh, I'm spoiling my list. Whoa. AJ, you asked about favorite Jess Franco, so I picked five of my favorite Jess Francos. Uh, number one, although these are not in order now that I just said number one for no reason, uh, Eugenie Desaad. Uh, Eugenie Desaad is great, uh, not to be confused with uh, Eugenie, uh, her story into perver- her, jur- uh, her journey into perversion or whatever. Uh, Eugenie Desaad is a masterpiece, easily one of Franco's saddest films. <laughs> not sadist, because, you know, they mispronounce sadist. They say saddest in movies dubbed in the 70s. No, it's just sad. Can't recommend that one enough. A Virgin Among the Living Dead. Wowie, wow, wow. Uh, this is an incredible, incredible film. Just, uh, I can't get enough of it. Need to watch it again soon. The hilarious Kiss Me Monster. Uh, Kiss Me Monster was one of the real joys uh, when I was doing my Franco Friday series. I picked Kiss Me Monster after watching the unfortunate Kiss Me Killer. Kiss Me Killer is sort of worth watching, but it's just a weird grubby movie. Uh, I said grubby earlier, didn't I? Just never mind. Just ignore Kiss Me Killer. Kiss Me Monster is a comedy spy movie that is perfect in every way. The dubbing especially is magical. Love it, love it, love it. If you want to see like the weirder side of Franco that's not gothic or porn, then check out Kiss Me Monster. Vampiros Lesbos. Uh, my very first Franco film, I suspect for a lot of... Uh, horror DVD collectors in the early 2000s. Uh, maybe Vampiros Lesbos was your first one too. Uh, it's it's certainly one of his easiest to get into. It's also one of his easiest to feel like, I got this guy. I know what to expect from this Franco guy because it has a lot of his tropes just jammed into it. Uh, it's another film I need to rewatch badly. And finally, one of the films that unfortunately was a lot of people's gateway... <laughs> to Franco. It's called Oasis of the Zombies. No, just don't. If you put this movie on in the 80s or you're watching it on all those uh, horror movie compilations and you couldn't get into it, don't worry. Just forget it. Just forget you even saw Oasis of the Zombies. However, if you thought it, you liked it, but you hated like that pan and scan crappy looking VHS transfer, then actually give the Blu-ray a chance because I gave the Blu-ray a chance and it freaking blew my mind. I don't recommend Oasis of the Zombies. I just, I can't even explain what I love about it so much. It's just something wonderful to take a nap to. I love it. Um, I have a lot of runners up with Jess Franco. So many, I don't even know kind of where to start. Uh, the sequel to Dr. Orloff, the sequel to the awful Dr. Orloff, a quasi sequel to it, uh, called The Secret of Dr. Orloff or Dr. Orloff's Monster, or as, uh, IMDB has it, The Mistresses of Dr. Jekyll. I love that one. It's, uh, jazzy and even more, like, obtuse than Dr. Orloff, which is a pretty straightforward movie. Uh, but yeah, check out that one. It's great. The cinematography is wonderful. Speaking of black and white, I love the diabolical Dr. Z. That's just great stuff there, of course. Uh, Bloody Moon is fantastic. I love She Killed an Ecstasy. I love Venus and Furs. Oh my god. Did I mention Succubus? Succubus is great. I too am a big fan of the erotic rites of Frankenstein, though my copy is the sans erotic version so i just have the rights of frankenstein with all the sex cut out uh that's a magical movie right there and uh faceless of course everyone loves faceless if you don't what do you love and just to be annoying i'll say one more uh the devil came from akasava that's a fun one so aj has a question does violence or sexy ladies determine a cult classic well, uh, and this is a bit of inside baseball at first, if you will. <laughs> uh, it maybe depends if your name is Peter Neal. Oh, is that from the uh, the Nice Ties group? The Nice Ties group, exactly. And uh, some people within that, they may say yes to that. <laughs> no, I, I, I don't think so, really. You know, I mean, it, it's it's not a bad thing, but it's it's not a make or break, you know. Can't hurt. No, 
I'm so tired of sexy ladies. Get them out of here. <laughs> Does violence or sexy ladies determine a cult classic? Yeah, um, my answer to this is neither of those things. Uh, I think it's vibe. It's the vibe, right? And yeah. now the vibe may include violence and sexiness, but, you know, it's the vibe alone that makes a cult classic of any stripe, right? It's got to just have that nice vibe. You're vibing out. Anything that, like, either you want to show people, you get excited about it, you have to show that you have to see this. Anything. I mean, it could be freaking Teen Witch. You know, like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Which, I want to be the most popular girl. <laughs> hey, Jeffrey, top that. Top that. <laughs> uh, but also just so, or something you're kind of ashamed of seeing, but you can't wait to watch again. So, yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, for me, the things that really get me going are actually the, the elements that, that contain neither of those things and that are <laughs> just... I like the the weird and somewhat boring moments. Those are the things that really <laughs> rev my engines. Vroom. <laughs> exactly. Does violence or sexy ladies determine a cult classic? Sexy ladies, hands down. Boom. Boom. See, you're the one that's brave enough to say it. Uh-huh. Yeah. Everybody else was like, oh, you know. Da, da, da. But then Brad's like, no, it's sexy ladies. No, I, I wrote it down. Sexy ladies. Bam. <laughs> Given the choices, I take the sexy ladies. Yes. Does violence or sexy ladies determine a cult classic? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I think I would be leaning more towards violence <laughs> a lot of times, though I think it's just the attitude uh, and, the, and the tone and the atmosphere that makes things cult. Because uh, a cult movie could be anything. And, and yeah, sexy ladies don't hurt. They don't hurt anything at all, ever. They're wonderful. Uh, and violence doesn't hurt anybody. When does violence ever hurt anyone, bro? AJ would like to know, what are your top five Gialli? So I got four honorable mentions here. And again, I could have gone really crazy with this. I'll just stick to the, <laughs> these four. Um, kind of related in that they're both, I suppose, kind of supernatural sort of stroke especially one kind of everything in the kitchen sink sort of jelly uh, or our uh, the killer reserve nine seats and mm, murder obsession yeah. oh flashback to episode 100 oh shit i guess i better find that stinger huh <laughs> yes please do Episode 100. Also, kind of flashback here to that uh, because they're kind of um, seen as kind of one being a proto slasher and one being, you know, very much in the, uh, you know, the, the golden era of the slasher. Uh, I think this is the first piece I did for Fang of Joy um, on uh, Pieces and Torso. Which, um, oh, and incidentally, both of those, they could. Um, totally go in um you know the sleazy film list and equally new york ripper could go in this list so yeah there's some a lot of bleed over in these lists nice very nice um ba -da -ba -ba -ba, forgot oh. what i was doing oh yeah yeah, yeah. no it's okay so I, <laughs> I derailed it with the honorable mentions um so my my top five then i guess yeah oh yes uh, <laughs> <laughs> i forgot we were doing honorable mentions too <laughs> oh don't worry about it oh sign of the times eh um <laughs> I'm just laughing because, you know, me and you last year, uh, everybody's just been like, um, oh, yeah, 20, 2016 sucks, 2017 sucks, 2018 sucks, 2019 sucks. And, you know, last year we said a few times, oh, man, we're barely hanging on here. And, oh, my God, this is just a whole, you know, to the nth degree other fucking level of this kind of shit. And again, anyway, another, uh, sorry, tangential there. Um, my top five. Bloody hell. So, number five, again, another flashback to my um, first episode I was on, I think, when you asked me a bunch of lists, didn't you? Including uh, top I sure five, did. I sure did. Top five, Jolly. And I think this one is in the same position, would be uh, good old uh, Five Dolls for an August Moon. Yeah. And following from that, uh, from the uh, Father to the Son, Blade in the Dark. You must be very perspicacious, because that's exactly <laughs> what I was thinking. <laughs> Oh, brilliant. Um, and uh, belated. Uh, happy birthday to Lambava. I think it was his birthday yesterday. Oh. 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 Yeah, man. The more Lambava, more better. 
Next up, uh, Case of the Bloody Iris. Oh my god, yes. Mm. I'd always enjoyed it, but it was really after I got the Blu-ray. Um, it just I was like, why is this not in my top five? I just feel like an <laughs> idiot, or top three even, you know. I love showing that to people who don't have any clue what a giallo is. I love mm. showing it to people who've never even seen an Italian film. Just mm. dropping them, just like a, like a bath of cold water, just throwing them in, because it always goes over so well. Oh man, it's yeah, it's just perfect for it, isn't it? And uh, it's funny you should say that because I know you've said this is another one that you often use as kind of a gateway jello for people. Um, uh, well, I have two here that are tied, uh, same mm. for number two and number one, but they're both tied by director. I've got uh, Seven Blunt Stained Orchids, which I think yeah yes. was the one that you you like to show people, mm-hmm. and um, Eyeball. Bam! Look at that. Mm. Hey, those are both on my list. I used to have Spasmo on here as a three-way tie as well, and I do love that one, but not on the same level I do these two, so it kind of had to get uh, get bumped off there. Oh. And uh, number one, I uh, got two Argento ones tied. We've got Four Flies on Grey Velvet and Tenebrae. Oh, yes. Tenebrae is also on my list. Mm. Very cool. I love it. Thank you. Top five Gialli. This is tough. I mean, there's so many, and I've seen so many, and I've loved so many. I mean, there are very few that I dislike. I feel like, once again, I'm going in a slightly French vanilla direction, but perhaps, you know. <laughs> all right, so uh, number one ever, all time, Red Queen Kill Seven Times yes. uh, is my favorite. The Emilio Miraglia joint, um, you know, I've I've spoken or at least written about the Scooby-Doo Gialli before. I love them. Uh, both of Emilio Miraglia's are wonderful. You know, uh, The Night Evelyn Came Out From Her Grave is very close to being as good as Red Queen Kill Seven Times, but Red Queen is better. Barbara Boucher. Mm-hmm. Deep Red is my favorite Argento. It's not even close. Um, so that, as I think, maybe like the best example of just like a purebred giallo that does everything you want, that's also in my top five. Uh, my favorite Falchi giallo because I feel like you got to represent him in some way, would be Don't Torture a Duckling. Yes. Um, which has, I think, the single greatest scene in all of Jalo history, which I think anybody who's seen the movie knows what I'm talking about. Uh, the fifth chord for a more mystery-inspired, uh, you know, uh, example of the genre, featuring a wonderful performance from Franco Nero and some truly mesmerizing cinematography. And then, because uh, I got to call out my boy Lindsay, I'm going to throw Eyeball in there as well. Yeah, <laughs> Which I prefer. It's, uh, <laughs> well, I don't know. I feel like Eyeball's maybe the more Lindsay appropriate title. Uh, but what's what's the Italian title? It's like um, Red Cats Red in a cats. Glass Maze. Yeah, I mean that's that's that is the most giallo title of all time. I'm sure that that was maybe like the original title that that Lindsay preferred, but I, I could also just see him saying, "Call it eyeball." <laughs> I invented eyes. <laughs> um, I actually have a little bit of a Lindsay uh, uh, tidbit for us that I think every regular listener of this. Uh, podcast would enjoy Ooh, um i uh recently received the ghost house vinyl release from terror vision records oh shit. Uh, the complete soundtrack it's a really great soundtrack actually in a, a beautiful uh colored vinyl release um but there are some liner notes from Lindsay himself uh which as you would imagine are insane from the first line on uh just to share with you uh, this opening line. He says, La Casa 3, Ghost House, is one of my movies belonging to the horror genre. But <laughs> since I'm a director that doesn't like too much stories based on traditional stylizations, I wrote the script adhering to a realistic plot. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. That's all you gotta need to know. Oh my god. Oh boy. I love how they had him write it in English. When they should have had him write it in Italian and then have an Italian person <laughs> translate it. Or, or, or a, a person from America who speaks Italian. But hey, what, maybe he demanded that he not be filtered. Yeah, unfiltered. <laughs> Hashtag unfiltered. <laughs> Hashtag pure Lindsay. I love it. What are your top five Gialli? Top five Gialli. I thought about this. Uh, reviewed my collection. I'm going to say the fifth chord, Ooh. all the colors of the dark. Yes. 
Death Walks on High Heels. Uh, the Umberto Lindsay Paranoia, the one where uh, Carol Baker is a race car driver. <laughs> yes. I've always loved that one. Always. Great. And My Dear Killer. Oh. I threw My Dear Killer in there. Whew. Man, our list That's one were... that... Oh, sorry. Go were ahead. they different? No, were they a lot different? Very different. Very different yeah. lists. Well, I, I thought probably, too, that, that they would be, and I wanted to kind of make mine different. I was thinking... My Dear Killer, it would be perfect for an Arrow Blu-ray. Boy, howdy. That that film just delivers and delivers so many times. It's so good. Yeah, it's a, sort of a George Hilton solo joint. And, uh, of course, the you know recently passed away George Hilton. I think that would be a really good one. I, still, it blows my mind that we don't have uh, The Case of the Bloody Iris on Blu-ray. I think that that would be... And if you told me we'd we'd have Who Saw Her Die on Blu-ray before <laughs> The Case of the Bloody Iris, or even the the Black Belly of the Tarantula we don't yeah. have on Blu-ray yet. And yet we have the Bloodstained Butterfly. Yes. And I'm like, ah, and, yeah. Okay, that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is not bad. It's just so not a go-to pick, you know. No, in fact, if I re- I've seen it once. I know that we, you know, we got the, the blue bootleg, but if if I remember correctly, is it one that's not? You're like this is a giallo, and then at the end it becomes a giallo. Yeah, I think there's a there's a giallo murder right at the beginning, right, and then there's stalking and weird stuff at the end, and there's this whole middle section of the film that's about, I think it's about just character stuff and then courtroom drama. <laughs> So yeah, yeah. It's it's not a it's not a fun one. It's not bad at all. But yeah, right. And I was surprised that you had a uh, death walks in high heels. That's interesting. Ooh, ooh, I love that one. Nice. I need to reevaluate. That is not one of my go to favorites either. Yeah, I know. It's funny because you've always been a death walks at midnight guy, which yeah. I love it too. Mm-hmm. If I had to, I don't know if that I could really pick between the two. Just this time I went with high heels because it's just, it's a fun one to me. And it's, it's one of those that's a giallo epic. It's, it's pretty long. Yeah. There's a lot going on in it. There's a lot going on in both of those, the Death Walks films. It has something extremely unique in it that very and few I giallos know, have. No, I know this time. You have asked me <laughs> many times, and I forget. But no, I know. You, do you want me to tell Please, you? Please, say it. Someone vomits. <laughs> I remember. Oh, my God. There is another vomit scene in a giallo-adjacent title. It's I call it a giallo because it's... It's got the right people, and it's got the music, and it's got the intrigue and everything. And it's uh, the I know what that is, too. You do? What is it? The Exorcist. <laughs> no, brother. Exorcist <laughs> 2, The Heretic. Actually, oh. it's, um, I think it's called the, oh, shit. I had it, and then my brain said, no, thanks. No, I'm not telling you. Uh, Robert Hoffman is in it, and Ooh. it's... It's one of those ones I found some some wonderful person had uploaded it to YouTube and they actually uploaded the um, English dubbed. Okay, here we go. This is some crazy titles. You ready for these crazy titles? I am. It's The Insatiables is the title that I know it, but it's 1969. Robert Hoffman and Luciano Paluzzi, John Ooh. Ireland, a few other people. Uh, directed by Alberto De Martino, that old so and so. That old so and so. And it has the single most disgusting puke. Like, not only is it gross that it's on camera, you get to see it happen. The uh-huh. the puke itself is like this guy went to the Shoney's breakfast buffet and said, "I'll just eat all the eggs." Oof. It's horrific, and it goes on, and then he falls in it. Oh, gee. Dude, I was like, I don't want to watch this movie anymore. <laughs> uh-uh. It's also not very good. <laughs> yeah. No. It's it's a file under for completists only. And, uh, yeah, it pushes the, the boundaries of what a giallo is big time, but it's still just thriller enough, you know? Right. Anyway. Anyway. Great list, sir. Thank you. Top five gialli. Oh, boy. 
Out of the billions of Giallo movies, I have picked things that I love very much, like my favorite Giallo of all time, Seven Bloodstained Orchids. I still don't know why this is my favorite. I know it's a fairly generic title. It's just comfort food viewing. I love it. Uh, Tenebre, because Tenebre is a masterpiece. The Dead Are Alive. Uh, you know, hey, the first show for Hello, This is the Doom Show is Brad and I talking about our love of The Dead Are Alive. Uh, this movie is endlessly watchable for me. I cannot get enough of it. I hate when people don't like it. Oh, <laughs> but I mean, I don't know why I get so passionate like that. Like, I've been able to let go of getting really mad when people don't love the same movies as me. Uh, but I still, like, I freak out when people don't like that one. <laughs> It's so dumb. I'm such an idiot. But yeah, I love it. Um, one of my favorite go-to vacation movies is Bloodstained Shadow. I've probably talked about it on this show before, uh, but once upon a time, uh, Lietta and I were going on our honeymoon, and I brought a DVD player and all the cables, and I brought uh, that Giallo movie pack from Anchor Bay, and I just brought movies to watch. I put on the Bloodstained Shadow and just fell in love with it all over again. It had never been a top tier one for me until that trip. So anytime we're driving and we're going to be staying at a hotel, I bring a DVD player, I bring all the cables, and of course I always bring Bloodstained, Sha Bloodstained Shadow for a rewatch. Something about it. And of course, the inimitable, the frickin' master himself, Umberto Lenzi's Eyeball. I love Eyeball so freaking much. I can't even, dude. I can't even get over Eyeball. It's just something about it. He's made better films. Seven Bloodstained Orchids is better. Uh, <laughs> so I got two Lenzies in my top five. A few honorable mentions that just didn't make the cut. Of course, The Night Evelyn Came Out of Her Grave. Red Queen Kills Seven Times. And the movie I show everybody who's never seen a Giallo before, people who've never even seen an Italian film before, I love, love, love showing them the case of the bloody iris. So there's some Giallo. The burning question. Mm. Lucio Fulci, master or hack? I would say master. I mean, I know, you know, he's... Um... Let's see. I mean, if we're comparing him to, say, you know, Bava or Argento, I mean, well, let's firstly, let's say, compare him to Argento. Both of them, you know, in their latter years had this kind of kind of drop off. And I would say, yeah, again, if I'm comparing the two, you know, in terms of somebody who was kind of, you know, kind of more of a, you know, at his peak, kind of more of a, you know, true kind of cinematic visionary, vi visionary, can't speak, uh, with his kind of use of camera and so on and so forth. You know, Argento is probably going to... Um, kind of edge him out there but you just look you know um that full chat is best you know just how um and yeah i know we have to give you know a lot of mad props obviously to the people he worked with here you know not least of all um you know like sergio salvati um, 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 sorry losing my train of thought here but you, you, you know basically how like in fulci's later years and in argento's later years you you, you kind of lose a bit of that um directorial verve isn't kind of as apparent i guess with either of them right but still, you know, I mean, they're all perfectly serviceable and, you know, doing, um, you know, very, um, like I suppose, um, comparatively, you know, around the, well, th the same time, you know, Fulci wouldn't have been getting the same budgets as Argento, I imagine, even though both <laughs> of them would be suffering. Considering what he had to work with and, you know, obviously all his health problems as well, of course, you know, I, I think he still, you know, is always, um, for the most part, bringing it. But yeah, you know, either of them you compare to, say, Barber who, you know, he really is kind of the master, I suppose, you know, comparatively. But it's it's all relative, isn't it? Exactly. No, I get tired of folks comparing uh, good old Lambava. The more Lambava, more better. To mm. his father all the time. Oh, man, yeah. That just drives me nuts. I'm like, really? Like, give the guy a break. Mm. A Absolutely. big, sexy break. <laughs> Lucio Fulci. Master or hacker? Does he know computer programs? No. Master or hack? Is he a uh, crash or is he a burn or is he a serial killer? That's a <laughs> hacker's a, joke. He's a zero. He's a zero cool. <laughs> zero. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's Lindsay. <laughs> uh, Fulci is a master hack, obviously. <laughs> that's all I got. <laughs> that's, hey, that's all we need. I love it. 
Here comes the burning question with the hot okay. the hot sauce all over it. Lucio Fulci, master or hack? Psh, master. I mean, <laughs> there's no there's no hackery about it whatsoever. <laughs> yep, that's uh, that's how I feel. I would think that that's probably the consensus. Yeah. Of uh, my fellow co-hosts. Hey, you take all the money away, you take the health away, and then you take, like, the, I don't know, the infrastructure of the Italian film industry away. Of course, it's going to be a little hacky, but I still like his later films. Right. Not everybody can have a Michele Soave moment in 1990s whatever. No. No. Lucio Fulci, master or hack? Well, that's easy. He's a master. He rolled with the punches in his career doing westerns and giallo and zombie movies, post-apocalyptic movies. He made frickin' uh, an erotic film. He made comedies. I mean, he started with comedies and really honed his craft just churning out those comedies and rock and roll films. And like a lot of these frickin' directors from that time, it was who they worked with. Uh, he had great screenwriters. He had great cinematographers. Always a great cast. When things started to turn south for him, it, it coincided with the Italian film industry kind of tanking. Or just, and not kind of, it was just tanking. And so a lot of his final films are pretty bad. Uh, but there's gems hidden in that stuff. I think anybody with his health problems, his uh, cantankerous attitude, and uh, just just bad luck near the end of his life. Um, he and Mario Bava had really crappy luck near the end. Uh, Bava had massive failures that he put his like everything into, like um, Rabid Dogs and Lisa and the Devil, and they were just he had the rug ripped out from under him. But Fulci. Uh, I really wish he'd had a chance to make stuff cheaper. Like if they just thrown out the film camera and used the money to just shoot on video. So a bigger budget for post-production, a bigger budget for gore and just shot on video. I mean, that would have been amazing. Like the way somebody handed Jess Franco a digital video camera before he passed away or gave him a fucking iPhone. Next thing you know, Franco's shooting in HD or shooting in on like HD tapes or whatever the hell he was doing at the end. That would have been great. I wish Lucio Fulci had made 200 films. I really do. The hack does happen when you're freaking old and you have no resources and you freaking burned every bridge in your, <laughs> in your career. So yeah, that was long winded. Thank you. How do you choose which co-hosts which film so mainly that's just me stealing titles mm. from each other like i'm like oh maybe maybe jeffrey won't notice if i steal this title and give it to brad <laughs> or if uh simon and i steal everything mm. but the answer is yes mm. yeah i uh i also have an answer to this question which you may not be aware of uh, but Ooh. you know since he asked and i cannot tell a lie so uh, yeah the, all everything you've said is true but there is a caveat to that which is i astrally project into your bedroom and convince you to give me what i want uh you know if you think of that um well. i know you and <laughs> I know you're not a fan of this film, but if you think of the ghost blowjob scene from Ghostbusters, that's kind of um, it's kind of how it works usually. <laughs> the ghost job? Mm. Exactly. Sorry, I was chasing my cat off my chair. <laughs> how do you choose which uh, which host co-hosts which film? And I thought that was a very interesting question, and I look forward to your answer. <laughs> I just see who will get hurt the most by me stealing a film from their list right and that's who doesn't get to do a film <laughs> no um it's it's such a weird process that i it's different every time um i run stuff by everybody when i literally don't know but a lot of times if i suspect strongly that you love something i will run it by you first do the same thing with jeffrey and simon go on there everyone's different tastes and sometimes uh when a listener suggests they will say you and brad must cover this this is a you and jeffrey movie this is a you and simon movie and i'm like all right hey the people have spoken 
Right. Um, like, the people have spoken to the podcast today. Right. Yeah. Um, pretty good. But, yeah, it's it's pretty random. It's pretty random. Sometimes I, I really don't intentionally steal. <laughs> we have years at worth of emails with, a, like, lists with dozens of titles. And then we go, oh, shit. Simon and I are going to do that. Is that okay that we talked about doing that f- six years ago? And you're like, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> well, I don't. I don't think. I, I can't imagine that there's any conflict whatsoever. Uh, uh, nope. We all we all have very specific, pretty specific uh, tastes as to what we want to do on the show. And I know that Jeffrey likes a lot of the uh, the oddities. Yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. Iced, things like that. Stuff I enjoy, don't get me wrong. But even I, from time to time, see a film and say, you know, that's a Jeffrey film. (laughs) Obviously, I'm not going to talk about Twin Peaks with you or anybody. (laughs) Uh, So that's Simon. And, you know, Simon, there are Simon-centric films as well. You know? I wasn't going to talk about Impulse. With you, that was clearly, you know, the purview of Nafa and you. Of course. Hey, uh, William Shatner plus Tampa, we're doing we're gonna, We were going to do that. And then we did it. Exactly. So, I don't think there's ever any conflict. I can't imagine. No. There is not a film. These days, especially, there's not a film that you could say, hey, I'm going to do this with Jeffrey or I'm going to do this with Simon. Do you care that I would say yes to you? <laughs> um, you know, there's just, you know where all of the strengths lie. And uh, apparently there's a lot of films that were made, and uh, the powers that be haven't stopped the show yet, so we're still going. Right. So. <laughs> yeah. Fun fact about Simon, uh, he's watching Twin Peaks right now. I bet that's true. Oh, yeah. It's totally true. <laughs> he watches it more than I breathe, and I never breathe. Ever. Do you have a favorite spaghetti western actor? Not really, because my exposure to them is still kind of limited to um, Leone, to be honest. But there is a guy I was thinking about, you know, from, I think, two of those films. Out of those three, I've always liked for a few dollars more than most, for whatever reason. Oh, yeah, me too. Awesome. Uh, and the guy who, I think he's in both the first film and in that. Is it Jean Maria Volante? Him oh, especially. Yeah. He's a great yeah. actor. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, you know, especially in for a few dollars more, he's just so oh fucking intense in that film. You know, he really, really sticks out. So yeah, maybe him. But I, yeah, like I said, I really need to watch more, don't I? Yep. Yeah, you do. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> do you have a favorite spaghetti western actor? Yes. Um, now, not in general. I, I can't think of an actor who has you know like consistently stood out to me like between performances so Mm. much in spaghetti westerns that is but i do love thomas million in um the fulci one four of the apocalypse yeah yeah he's real good in that and i guess also you know shout out to franco nero of course in uh django uh that's a pretty iconic role even though other people played it nobody played it quite so quite so cute as franco nero (laughs) Yeah, he immediately sprang to mind. It took me a while to think of someone who wasn't him for my answer. Yeah. Uh, The last question from AJ is, who is your favorite spaghetti western actor? This was easy. There is one that goes above all others in my estimation, and that's Johnny Garko from the Sartana films. (laughs) Excellent choice. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I love the Sartana films. I stopped at a gas station many moons ago before. I might have been married. Maybe I was married, but I hadn't been married long. And they had the DVD set of the Sartana films. I bought it. And then when uh, Arrow announced that they were putting out the entire set, I had to have it. Amazing. So, yeah, Johnny Garko, he's uh, rakish and... uh, (laughs) I just he, he's great in Sartana films, and I've seen him in a. There's a couple of other spaghetti westerns I think I've seen him in, but no, he's fantastic for the part of Sartana, and I just really enjoy those films. Awesome. Uh, they usually have labyrinth plots, so I never remember exactly what's going on. Uh, Klaus Kinski's in at least one of them, maybe two of them. George Hilton plays Sartana in the last one, which I mean, oh, you could wow. say no, George Hilton. So, bonus. 
So yeah, I've I've seen at least one Sartana film, and like you, I mean, I don't know which one I saw, and, right? And, uh, but yet I have that set, and I still haven't cracked it out. They have the so best bad. titles. Light the fuse because Sartana has on fresh underwear. Exactly. Yep. If you have an inch, Sartana will scratch it. <laughs> uh, Sartana's boots are big. Help him clean out the dryer lint. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Something like that. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> have a nice funeral. Sartana will pay for oh, your that's, coffin. That's so good. Yeah. Good stuff. They're fun. They're very, they're very James Bond spy film mystery spaghetti westerns as of course you'd put together man well so my favorite spaghetti western actor man this was weird because i kind of have fallen off of watching spaghetti westerns uh westerns don't really get a lot of play in the schmidt house here that being said my favorite spaghetti western actor is fernando sancho but let's look at uh fernando sancho's western credits for a moment here According to IMDb, he was in 59 Westerns. Minnesota Clay, directed by Sergio Corbucci. Oh, man. Uh, he was in the Ringo movies with uh, Guilano Gemma. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. So, Pistol for Ringo and The Return of Ringo. Uh, they replaced <laughs> they replaced Ringo with Richard Harrison. $100,000 for Ringo. <laughs> so, Fernando made it, but... Uh, Mr. Gemma did not. He was in The Big Gun Down, which is a freaking classic. I want to say I've seen Seven Guns for the McGregors. That sounds really familiar. Man, he was in a lot of freaking spaghetti westerns. Holy shit. He was in Dig Your Grave, Friends, Sabata's Coming. So he made it into a Sabata movie. So yeah, I, I just really like him. He's got a great screen presence. Uh, he's always playing like a trashy, sleazy dude. Uh, he plays a comedic foil for the hero really good. Uh, yeah, I really like Fernando Sancho. This next email comes from Derek B. He says, Hey guys, Derek B. from Cinema Attack, Celluloid Dissections, No More Room in Hell, They Are Here, and Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space Podcasts. Yes, I know I'm a busy man. Just first off, congrats on reaching a milestone of 200. That is an amazing feat that I will hope to reach with one of my five shows one day. You guys bring joy to me as a lover of schlock and awesomeness. So here is a quick question for you guys. Well, maybe not quick. I was curious, what would be your top 10 favorite Euro-based creature features? The schlockier, the better. Congrats again, and I'll see you guys at the next milestone. Lambava! Drop sample. The more Lambava, more better. Well, to be honest, Eric, I really struggled with this one because I was kind of being... I suppose a bit, well, not pedantic, but I was kind of questioning the, you know, how are we defining a creature feature here? You know, are we are we including, you know, Dracula, Frankenstein, zombie films, so on and so forth? Or is it, you know, kind of more, um, you know, kind of outside of that? So I only really have one here, Ooh. but uh, I suppose I could say a few others off the top of my head in a minute. Uh, sure. You know, if, um, well, I mean, how would you define a creature feature? Because I know it's kind of more of a kind of a term that, uh, you know, there's a lot more currency of it. You know, yeah, you know. I'm thinking. Um, I'm thinking Frankenstein. I'm thinking Dracula would count, and maybe a mummy, but also mm-hmm. like any monsters, like uh, mm. things that aren't human. You know, they didn't have kaiju over mm. there. God mm. help us! I wish they had. <laughs> um, other than that weird uh, Godzilla recutting that mm. Luigi Cozzi did. All right, it's like he did like this trippy. A late 70s uh, colorized version of Godzilla that's really bizarre. Nice. I need to see that. So yeah, anything with anything with a monster and you know, no uh, no slasher killers. Okay. The one that I did write down, and even now I'm kind of questioning whether this counted, but fuck it, it's on here anyway, was uh, <laughs> no Rats and Night of Terror, which I suppose is oh, more of an, nice. an, an animal's attack. But again, I suppose, again, depending on how we're defining creature. But off the top of my head, you know, uh, going back to Franco, I said, you know, Rats of Frankenstein, yeah. uh, related to that, like Dracula's daughter, you know, I really love, and what mm. is it, Dracula, Prisoner of Frankenstein. There's, oh, what is it, Lady Frankenstein. I've only actually seen that one, so I really need to rewatch that. The Devil's Wedding Night. Oh my uh, god, yes. Let's think. Zombie movies, we could really get carried away, you know, from like, you know, Nightmare City to Zombie Holocaust. You would set about Burial Ground, a Living Dead at Manchester Morgue. I'm sorry, I feel like um, if I'd actually, <laughs> you know, kind of come to this answer before of how we seen about definition, I would have done a proper list. So sorry for kind of dropping the ball there. Oh no. Uh, Derek was 
um, being obtuse on purpose. He always does that. Ah, okay. He's very, is why he's so mysterious. Uh, on a mystery. I did not have 10. Um, it was hard to think of 10. Um, but the ones that I thought of, I think, are all essential. Um, I do think you have to take a moment, much like with uh, the term sleazy, you have to sort of think about what a creature feature is. So anything that was like a, like a sort of standard issue monster, you know, your, your Dracula, your Frankenstein, your Wolfman, uh, none of those, I think, are creature features. So it has to be something like more, like a little bit stranger than that. It can be of alien origin, but it cannot be specifically like an alien it's com- it's confusing, but I'll give you my examples, and I think you'll know what I mean. Okay. Uh, so, Hunchback of the Morgue uh, would be a top one, Ooh. not for, of course, Paul Nashie's Hunchback character, but for the Lovecraftian monstrosity that is <laughs> locked behind a door for most of the film oh, until yes. the conclusion. Yes. Uh, I think that's an essential one. Um, Horror Express, which I think is technically an alien, but obviously is pretty different from like your standard issue bug eyed, uh, alien. Uh, so I think that one counts, uh, lovely, lovely creation and details of like how that monster works and spreads. Um, Mill of the Stone Woman, uh, is another, I think, Wonderful movie, probably the best of the movies I'm mentioning here, uh, that also features a really cool sort of creature at its core. Oh, wow. Um, the Lorelei's Grasp is another good one. Yes. <laughs> the, definitely the, <laughs> the lesser of the movies that I'm mentioning here in terms of overall quality, I think. Um, but has a, uh, wonderfully, uh, uh, constructed sexy, uh, <laughs> monster. Um, and then, uh, lastly, Kaltiki, the immortal monster, Ooh. a sort of proto blob, uh, which is, I think, extremely effective. Nice. I have that Blu-ray. I still have not cracked it open, though. Oh, you got it. It's so good. Nice. I was curious what would be your top 10 favorite Euro-based creature features. The schlockier, the better. And I'm like, 10 of what? Did you have an answer for this one, sir? I do not. I would ask him most kindly and thank him for his question, but ask him, uh, feel free to send in another question or <laughs> uh, five more questions. I just, I don't have an answer to it. I don't, I have not seen, I can't think of any. I even thought about the Jaws ripoffs that they did in Italy, but I haven't even seen any of those. Yeah. So. Out of the Jaws ripoffs, the ones, uh, the, the one that I enjoy uh, was uh, good old Lambava's devil fish. The Mo Lambava, Mo Beta. Yeah, and I haven't seen it. Oh my god, it's ridiculous. This is a toughie, because it's like, is this Frankenstein, does that count? Does Dracula count? Does some other, like, uh, the Lorelei's grasp? You know, does that count? So... Yeah. Well, Derek's going to get back to us. Yeah, and Derek, like Brad said, you want to send us, like, five more questions to make up for this? We'll... We'll do it. Yes. And it, actually, if he wants to send in his list, oh, I would yes. love to hear them. Yes. Yeah. Send us the list. Because he's the master of all things kaiju. And unfortunately, there weren't any Japanese, Italian co-productions. That would have been wonderful. Amazing. Hold on. Wait a minute. This would have been bad. Okay. So you have a Japanese and Italian co-production with German money. <laughs> That's the Aztec <laughs> powers. Oh, no. Uh, I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> And I said axis of powers, plural. Axis of powers. The axes. <laughs> mm-hmm. All right. So, Paul has sent in- We won that war, by the way. Oh, yeah, I know. I was there, dude. I know. I know. It's called <laughs> the Korean conflict. Uh-huh. Police action, my ass. <laughs> I would like to send a police action to your ass. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, so, I had a few- movies in my brain to answer Derek's question even though like we said Derek you tried to stump us because we we totally overthought this question so uh here are just a few uh european freaking creature features uh one is island of the doomed uh with uh cameron mitchell adam age vampire which uh you can check out I think it's episode 149 that uh, Tyler and I did, where uh, we talked about Adam Age Vampire, which is as creature feature as it gets, y'all. 
Uh, the Lorelei's Grasp is a magnificent film. Can't recommend that one enough. And uh, Lady Frankenstein. I tried to stay away from the Frankenstein, Dracula, Wolfman, whatever, because, you know, Jeffrey made me self-conscious about saying those things. But Lady Frankenstein, the Frankenstein is so weird that it kind of doesn't even count as a Frankenstein. It's the light bulb head. It's just weird looking. And last but not least, uh, the movie nobody wanted me to say, they tried to stop my freedoms. <laughs> Demons 3, the ogre. Uh, <laughs> and that's a creature feature from uh, a very bad dimension, but yeah. Our pal Paul of the uh, Shy Yeti podcast writes in, and he says, If you could go back in time to see any of the films that you have covered on Hello, This is the Doom Show back when they were first released, which of the films would you choose? P.S. On my podcast, we have a co-host named Ick, who is a friendly alien with a UFO. He'd be willing to take you to the premiere of the film you choose. But the time travel module on his ship can be a bit shaky, so... Uh, you said we could have one or maybe three. I cheated. Well, I suppose I did them together because I have four. Oh, no, five. Six. Oh, shit. <laughs> Never mind. A lot, some of these are related. Um, <laughs> God, that got out of hand, didn't it? Um, right, so in no particular order. Um, firstly, I've got Twin Peaks Firewalk with me. Oh, my God, yes. To hear the booing. Mm, oh, boy, yeah. I, I just remember back, um, you know, again, going back in time. Oh, we're getting all nostalgic this episode. I suppose it makes sense, doesn't it? Hey, it's, it's the time to do it. It certainly is. Uh, I remember you saying, can you just imagine, you know, after that prologue in particular, you know, if you're sat in a theatre and when um, the, the Twin Peaks sign and the music drops, can you just imagine what that would have been like? And yeah, God, I wish I, I could go back and uh, have experienced that. I've got Nightmare on Elm Street, which would be any, really, but especially one and two. I mean, uh, maybe even more so, you know, if it was for the... Pa well, no, both of them for different reasons. The first one more for kind of the kind of, you know, with a packed, you know, uh, receptive audience scene, kind of how all the scares land. And the second one, you know, again, with a packed receptive audience, just for hopefully it just, you know, degenerating into a complete laugh riot. I could imagine that would have been hysterical seeing that in a, uh, a theatre of people. I would hope. <laughs> yes. Kill Baby Kill. Oh, yeah. So I uh, just saw any bar of a film on the big screen. And um I've got two more. These are related because we did an episode of them together. Uh, and just both, again, I think they would just be really fun to watch with a, with a good crowd. Our uh, Blood Rage and Stage Fright. Wow. Yeah, that would be... I was just listening to that episode. That's a fun one. Ah, fantastic. So what would you time travel to go see? This was... I knew the answer immediately. Um, it absolutely has to be boarding house blown up to 35 millimeter and screened in an actual theater, which apparently it did <laughs> as we covered on our episode. <laughs> Is that the pre, uh, 1999 effects? The, uh, <laughs> yes. the, the windows movie maker effects or whatever they use? I would have to imagine. So yeah, I think this is the OG cut Holy just, shit. just to like be at like a premiere for that and just, or no, you know what I would want to, I would want to be in like, a major metropolitan area where maybe this was screening and just go with a random audience who has no idea <laughs> what they're about to see. That's what I want. Um, that or maybe a face with the face with two left feet. Um, just so I could like be dancing in the, in the aisles. Nice. Very nice. Ooh, those are good answers. <laughs> okay. Paul would like to okay. know if you could time travel to see any film that you have covered on the show in its original run, where, when, and who, and why? What is it? Okay, so I took a list. I took a look. I took a look at the films that you and I had covered, and one stood out that I would like to have been at the premiere of. It's one uh, that I think still is underrated and underseen. It does not have a DVD or a Blu-ray release, and that would be The Haunting of Julia. Oh, man, that's such a great answer. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, Rosemary's Baby obviously is a is a classic, yeah. and I love it, but people sleep on the the really, really, really good horror film that she made in the 70s. Mia Farrow, and that would be The Haunting of Julia. Man, um, I, I just want to throttle whoever's cock-blocking that release. Like, whoever's stopping I, that, I want to make them pay, because that is such a perfect freaking movie. Yes, I think that, uh, you know, we're getting things, you know, like 
let's scare Jessica to death on Blu-ray, and I think it's it's time that we got The Haunting of Julia. Yeah. I would even accept it if they just released it and titled it Full Circle, which I think is not nearly as good a title, but I'd buy a Full Circle Blu-ray. Yeah, whatever it takes. Get it out there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'd even love to see it streaming, like, because that's what I thought. I thought that... I don't know where I thought this, that it was somewhere on Amazon Prime at some point, but I think I was just mixing it up with something else, because I don't even know if that happened. Hmm. I don't know. I have two films that I would totally time travel to see in the theater, so I would love to see uh, Prom Night at the drive-in in 1980, when it came out, or 1981, and I would just go to the frickin' disco afterwards and then get sweaty, and then snort uh, pot marijuana up my nose. And the other one, I would totally buy a time machine or borrow yours, no matter how dodgy it is, and go see The House by the Cemetery in Italy when it came out. Preferably not in the summertime when it came out. I'd probably wait for a showing when it was a little cooler. I can't imagine... The crowd in 1981 watching House by the Cemetery. It must have been freaking wild as shit, dude. We got another email here from Mark Cotton. Mark, first of all, thank you for contributing. It means a lot. I hope this microphone sounds good because you bought it, buddy. Mark says, Dear Richard, congratulations on your 200th episode and a huge thank you to you and your co host for your wonderful podcast. There are some very good and even excellent podcasts out there that focus on horror films, but yours is the best and is my favorite. The movies that are talked about, your appreciation and knowledge of these films and the people who made them, the way that the episodes are edited, the music and the humor of the show are some of the things that make your podcast immensely enjoyable. It is thanks to you that I became aware of several movies that I now love. These include A Muck Train, The House with Laughing Windows, Zombie 5 Killing Birds, Murder Obsession, Monster Dog, and Death Smiled at Murder. Also, your show encouraged me to view movies that I was aware of and had not yet watched. Now I love many of them, like Lady Frankenstein, Ghost House, Hack-O-Lantern, Bloody Moon, The Demon, and Zader. So again, a big thank you to you and your co-hosts, and congratulations on your 200th episode. I sincerely hope that there are many, many more. Best wishes, Mark. Mark sent in a postscript to this one. Like you, I was born in the mid-70s, and I had a similar experience to the one that you had with The Creeping Flesh. I chanced upon that remarkable Peter Cushing slash Christopher Lee slash Lorna Heilbronn movie in the early 1980s when it was playing on one of our two local TV channels. And my goodness, that movie not only freaked me out, it really haunted me. Talk about the vibe. Whoa. Well, Mark, thank you so much for this wonderful email. I really appreciate it. You are a cool dude. And man, you have some great taste in movies, so... I love that the Vibe episode was so big for people. Brad and I did that. I think we talked about episode three or something like that. Just made a list of those those films that were always searching for that indescribable sensation, that freaking morbidly sincere weirdness that comes from uh, Italian, Spanish, sometimes even Japanese horror. Uh, the morbidity, the freaking camera angles down a creepy old hallway, mansions that are abandoned and strange architecture, beautiful women, seances, all these things just give me that vibe. I want to do a part two of that vibe episode, but uh, I don't know. Maybe one day we'll we'll revisit it properly. Brad and I will have to uh, do some secret meetings behind the scenes, bro. And I love that you have the demon listed. Uh, the the list of people who love the demon, that slasher movie. <laughs> Not to be confused with Night of the Demon. Uh, the demon is this like slasher that's they tried to rip off Halloween. They didn't know what the hell they were doing. It's so wonderful. For giving my family caffeine free, Pepsi free. <laughs> You're looking at two of them. We are Pepsi free. Your mom bought this caffeine free cola. I said, no way. Then I tasted it. We are Pepsi free. Pepsi free's got great taste. Who needs anything else? And all that taste is caffeine free. Just taste it. We are Pepsi free. Regular and diet. We have another email here from our pal Martin Luther Presley. 
He says, <laughs> Dear Duders of Doom, I've been there from the beginning, from the speakerphone Brad days, sometimes tuning in every day, it seems. I've taken you on holidays, on airplanes, and on train rides, and fallen asleep to your familiar voices and the vibe episode in particular more often than you care to know, which is supposed to be a compliment. And then all of a sudden I'm off again for a while, but as you know, I'm always coming back. I've checked out countless movies because of you, many of which I enjoyed, many of which I can hardly believe anyone enjoys, but hey, that's the fun of it all, watching these duds and masterpieces and listen to you talking about them. Like dropping in on a conversation some friends are having. And I thank you for letting me eavesdrop. I remember a time when I bought obscure DVDs from faraway places and dubious sources just to listen to an episode. Funny how things have changed and how it's become much easier during the Doom Show's run. Last decade's neglected Z movie is now a limited deluxe 4K edition. In crazy times like these, it's comforting to know that there's a fun, good-hearted group of movie nerds that provide much-needed relief. Thank you for being nice people when at times it seems the bastards have taken over. All the best, and congratulations, Martin Luther Presley. Martin Luther Presley. Our bud, bud, bud. MLP has indeed been around since the beginning. <laughs> believe him when he says it uh but yeah dude thank you so much you're so kind you are a huge part of our freaking community i know that your secret hidden love of twin peaks the return uh is just hidden behind this mask of rage same thing with the sinister eyes of dr orloff which uh, you very convincingly at the time acted like you hated it but dude pfft, we saw right through that shit. And MLP, the fact that you listened to us while you were falling asleep, that scares me. I mean, do you have horrible nightmares? <laughs> I know I have horrible nightmares about my face. Uh, so moving on to the audio portion, we had just a few more questions. Uh, another one from Paul. Hello. Hello, this is The Doom Show. It's me, Paul, sometimes known as Shayetti, from the Shy Life Podcast. I just wanted to ask a really serious question, because I know you like really serious questions. My question is this. If you had to marry a horror film, which horror film would you like to marry? And what colour would your outfit be? Thank you. That is my very serious question. Happy 200th episode. May there be 200 more. At least. Well, I have two answers on here, because again, sorry, I'm a cheater. Um, the first one I have uh, is Prom Night. And nice. I would have to wear, of course, uh, Jamie Lee Curtis's pink dress. But there's caviar and the killer's sparkly balaclava. <laughs> it's a perfect winning combination there. <laughs> indeed, indeed. They missed out by do not doing the sequel with that. Oh, man. And the uh, the disco ball head. Yeah. Yes. Oh, boy. One day. <laughs> one day, man. Oh, and, my God. Um, <laughs> partway through uh, my second answer, uh, watching... Um, bloody moon i was just i've always been amazed by the the amazing um costumes in that especially An angela's many funky swears so maybe one of those or fuck it all of them you know if it was really cold <laughs> gets cold in spain what horror film would you marry and what color would your outfit be okay so i would marry the bride aka last house on massacre street Yes. Um, because she seems nice and she has a house. Granted, it's on Massacre Street, <laughs> which doesn't seem like the, the most friendly neighborhood. I've heard the neighborhood watch on Massacre Street is very, uh, <laughs> at least it's not Dead End Street. Also going to say that Massacre Street sounds better. Um, you know, I could have gone with the, uh, Bloodstained Bride, but all she's got is a dress. You know, I want right. a house. I want a house. Exactly. I want a place to put all my movies. <laughs> You're um, thinking. You're thinking ahead. I like that. My outfit would be the color of the sheen from the Raft episode in Creepshow 2. Ooh. Um, I well think that played. all the guests would call me Radiant. <laughs> they wouldn't have a choice. Yeah. I decided that I would marry the first film that Elizabeth and I saw once we were married. <gasps> And it was on our Italian horror honeymoon, and that would be Mario Bava's shock. Oh my god. That's so great. What would you wear? Mm. I would wear, of course, yellow, the color of the giallo. Nice. I've never actually owned anything yellow, but I would do it. <laughs> I bet it'd be a good color on you. Thank you. And that, that was a really good question, too. Ooh, you could make uh, Elizabeth's dress out of flying box cutters. 
That's true. I mean, I wouldn't have to because she's already got a dress made of flying box cutters. <laughs> well, I mean a new one. Not the one we keep a seeing one. Yeah. over and over again. Well, that's true. <laughs> so, our... Oh, our, Lambava. Our, oh, Lambava. You... Dad said it was cool. <laughs> the Mo Lambava. Mo better. I definitely didn't co-direct this one. Right, right. He wasn't too tired. That's another one that we need a Blu-ray of that we don't have, and that's that Shock. Oh, man. I've got that freaking crazy Japanese poster of Shock I like to brag about. Yeah, you do. Oh, it's so hot and sexy. I put pinholes in it because I don't give a dang. No, you don't. It's getting buried with me, y'all. Yeah, it is. All right. Far, far from now. <laughs> Maybe tomorrow. If I could marry any horror film, uh, what film would it be and what would I wear at my wedding? Well... I would definitely marry the film Madman from 1982, and my wedding dress, be a full-on dress, would have two things that make it special. One, it would have a TP belt buckle, and the other is the color. The color would be murky, the murky color of the water of the hot tub for when I spun with my, my beau, who would obviously be TP himself. It's funny... How important TP is nowadays. Hello, hello, this is the Doom Show. This is Dan from Corrupted Youth Podcast. I just wanted to congratulate you guys on your 200th episode. So, a big thank you to Brad, Jeffrey, Simon, and I guess Richard. One thing I learned from listening to your show over the years is that I had to go back and embrace what I love about movies that may be a little bit cheesy and of questionable quality. Because that's one thing that you folks do. You really just embrace it and you can talk about it and even make fun of it, but it never feels cynical. That's kind of hard to do sometimes, and I really appreciate that. And you guys really just love the quirkiness of these movies. It's an absolute blast listening to you. I think the show is funny. I like the awkward moments where the editing will get all goofy and and whatever. That really appeals to me. I mean, your show is definitely something very special. I really look forward to when I can listen to a new episode. So I won't take up more of your time because I'm sure you're being just showered with all sorts of other folks sending in stuff. So I'm going to get moving. Thanks again for everything that you do and giving us all this lovely entertainment. Keep doing what you're doing. Don't stop. Keep moving on because I think the world would be a little less fun without you. Dan, Dan, Dan. Dan. Thank you so much, man. You are way too nice. When you mentioned questionable quality, my ears really perked up because I said, ooh, is someone talking about me? It'd be way too easy to do a show where we hated on stuff, where we watch what we would think is a bad movie and just pick it apart. Instead, we'll pick a bad movie and pick it apart because we adore it and we can't wait to watch it again and we're trying to get folks to enjoy or suffer with us, you know, that... that uh pleasurable suffering that I've been hearing so much about from all those Jess Franco films. Yeah, we, we try to go into the show picking stuff that we love. Uh, we've had a few mishaps over the years. We were uh, talking about things that uh, Jeffrey or I will accuse the other of picking. We've had a lot of that lately, where he mentioned a film that looks amazing, and I assume that he wants it on our list. And so the next time I talk about it, I'm like, I acquired said film. When do you want to do this? And he goes, oh, oh, I guess next week. And then we record this episode and then we're both blaming each other for picking the film. But really, it was me who just assumed he was picking it. We, we try to just cover stuff we love and look for good in everything. Because Why do you want to feel like you've wasted your life? When you've watched so many movies. So just go into everything with a freaking open mind and laugh at the stuff that's stupid. And who knows? Maybe you'll enjoy something. We weren't showered, per se, with um, praise for this episode 200. Uh, we, were giving, we were given a very uh, luscious massage from our listeners. An oily massage. But it wasn't a shower. I had to shower afterwards if you know what I mean. Oh, and folks, make sure you check out 
Dan's podcast, the uh, Corrupted Youth Podcast. It's a freaking wonderful show. He watches movies with his son. Freaking hilarious. So do it. Dan wrote in. He did not ask a question. Oh, yeah. But I have something to say. Please. Dan said something very, very, and very, very important and very, very dear to my heart. Dan said that, that we were never cynical. And that, I think, is the basis of Hello, This is the Doom Show. From the start, we said we were going to talk about films that we liked, films that we loved. And if you do that, there's no reason to be cynical. (laughs) And I am so excited, so happy that he said that, you know, that someone hopefully recognized that. You know, we've only covered one film, you and I, that that we didn't like. And we weren't really that hard on it, really. (laughs) I really appreciated Dan saying that because that was that was our hope, you know, from the jump is that we wouldn't be cynical. Yeah, because a lot of what drives us is just I give up on a lot of podcasts when they're like really harshing on a film for a really long time. And if Mm -hmm. it's not a fun spirited or, you know, like like a not mean-spirited, fun discussion, it just kind of mm-hmm. wears me down a little bit. And I'm like, yeah, but what do you guys enjoy, you know? And there are movies, that, like a podcast where they just, they just rip apart movies, but then they also love it. So I like that, too. I like that mix. Uh, that there's too many angry voices out there. <laughs> well, I mean, no one was going to turn to us for a, like a truly <laughs> nonpartisan uh critical thinking you know that just wasn't what we set out to do yeah it started out that we just wanted to talk about movies that we both loved i can think of two films that we definitely covered that uh we did not enjoy uh one one was i thought was going to be so funny because it was so bad and you were like i hated this and i was like (laughs) (laughs) what was that soul survivors Yep, that's what I was thinking. Man, that one was, oh my god. <laughs> and uh, the other one was when we did our Prom Night Megasode, we watched that remake. Oh, yeah. And we yeah. had nothing good to say about it. We no. also had nothing to say about it. Uh-uh. Well, two out of 200 is not bad. Yeah. Th- you know, and, you know, stuff comes up in conversation that I, I'll say, meh, too, but a lot of times anybody can just bring it up in the right way, and I will give it another shot. Like, recently on the, I think it was in our group, where somebody was talking about Return of the Living Dead 2. Maybe it was David Assassino. Maybe. And and I, I think it was him. If it wasn't him, I apologize who brought it up. But I, I was like, what about you, Richard? W- what about you on this movie? And I'm like... I hated it as a kid, hated it because it Mm -hmm. was silly. Right. But I bet you anything, put it on right now, I'd be totally into it. That's my guess is that I I have, I will find a new respect for it. If, well, find, just find some respect for it. I have never seen it. Oh man, it's crazy. It definitely doesn't have that bleak tone of the first one. Right. That's right out the window. (laughs) (laughs) But that's in its favor, because that's one of the things that keeps me from watching the first one a lot, is because it makes me really depressed, so. Yeah, I can I can see that. Oh, yeah. But no, I appreciated Dan saying that. I mean, his whole email was great, but I just, I wrote that down when he said, you guys are never cynical, and I was just so, I was so happy to hear somebody say that, because that was, again, that was our intention. Dude, that's what's going to change the whole program. We're going to be the, hello, this is the oof, meh, show. <laughs> and uh, we're gonna rate movies meh. on a, a two a two word scale. Is your movie oof or is your movie meh? Yeah, XD. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna do a hello. This is the cancel show. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be like, hey Brad, this movie slaps. <laughs> uh, this this uh this movie's a bop, Richard. <laughs> Move over, Jello Jello, who moved the tombstone. Hello, this is the Bop Show. Hello, this is the Boop Show. <laughs> Hi, Richard, Brad, Jeffrey, and Simon. This is Travis Linthicum. Congratulations on 200 episodes. That's a lot. Thanks, guys, for doing the show. Uh, I'm always excited to get a new episode, and I love what you all bring to it individually. Each of you have a unique chemistry with Richard, and it makes for a great show. I'm not sure... 
the setup of this episode, but I figured I'd throw out a couple of my favorite films to hear your opinions on them. I know Richard loves Slumber Party Massacre, but what do you guys think of the sequel? I like the first one too, but I think the second one's a top five favorite for me. And I feel the same way about Sleepaway Camp. The second one is just better than the first one for me. Have you guys seen either of them recently? And what do you think about them? Also, we've heard the Richard and Brad origin story, but how did Jeffrey and Simon become friends with Richard? All right, thanks guys. I hope we get as many episodes as you guys want to make. Keep them coming. I hope you all are staying safe and healthy out there with the outbreak. Uh, It's getting pretty crazy in Oregon, but I'm doing well. All right, good luck. Bye, guys. Travis. Oh, Travis. Thank you so much, sir. Um, You made me laugh really hard when you said, that's a lot. (laughs) I interpreted it as, you've made too many episodes, fuckers. Uh, But yeah, Travis, uh, you are also one of the wonderful people who's contributed financially to the show. Thank you so much for helping us pay for the bandwidth and the frickin' hosting. That stuff really, really makes a huge difference. So thank you, sir. And thank you for writing in. I hope we make more stuff you like. Travis would like to know. Travis would like to know, what are your thoughts on Slumber Party Massacre 2? Oh, I love it. I love it. You know, not kind of on the same level as I do, number one, because of that, you know, probably after Prom Night, nearly tied with it, it's kind of my favorite, you know, non-franchise slasher, well, non-big franchise. But yeah, it just, um, it's just, it's one of those films you kind of, not on kind of the same level, but you know, it is kind of pretty nuts, you know, not on the same level as something like House Sue, but still, you kind of have to pinch yourself a bit and kind of go, I'm not, I'm not tripping balls here. This is actually a film, isn't it? You know, thank God. <laughs> Exactly. So uh, he'd also like to know, what are your thoughts on Sleepaway Camp 2? Well, I hadn't seen this until uh, I think last year I got the Blu-ray. And nice. I've only seen it once, and it is currently in my uh, rewatch pile, actually, but I flipping loved it. Uh, maybe more so than the first one. You know, I like the first one, but um, I have to kind of be in the right mood for it, you know. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of 2. And uh, as I remember, it had an insane flipping body count, didn't it, I think? <laughs> yeah, it's way up there. Mm, mm. <laughs> so uh travis would also like to know the uh the origin of how you and i met well i get the chronology kind of a bit mixed up here because this is back in the god it just seems like you know this last decade <clears throat> you know time is just especially the last five years is just kind of come unglued or something but i think when i was first uh getting into jelly probably found do movie thon and your uh, you know jello meltdowns and various movie thons and i think that probably led me onto the podcast by proxy pretty sure that was the way it went a few years later because you know i um like uh, i think uh, good old mlp was saying you know it would take your podcast around you know all over the place you know like commuting to work uh, when i was when i used to uh, when my granddad still lived in his house i used to do a lot of gardening for him i remember um you know, listen to a lot of episodes there and eventually some years later finally um I think sent you an email and kind of began began corresponding with you yeah i think that was yeah 2013 i think yeah wow yeah exactly man jeez and um in 2016 you um interviewed me on that i think it was it was episode 110 and the then Simon we, show yeah exactly yeah <laughs> uh, like i say i, I re listened to that because um yeah, just thinking we, we we really have come full circle with this episode. And uh, then we did Twin Peaks and some other things. And it was some time later you guys asked me to uh, become a uh, proper co-host, which, yeah, still uh, immensely flattered by. You taught us what the word proper means. Oh, well, thank you. We were saying proper. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> For some reason, I remember like a see-through negligee and the jumbo bottle of J&B. Hmm. And I think that's what started our our relationship. <laughs> Not just co-host and hosts. Oh, yeah. A, mm. a bro marriage. That's why we got bro marriage counseling. Indeed. 2020, we're heading for that seven-year itch, man. You know, so we better watch <laughs> out. Oh, I'll scratch it. Ooh. Wow. Ooh. Wow. Ooh. Wow. Ooh. Wow. I just misconstrued the meaning of seven-year itch. I like that I did that. <laughs> oh, no, you didn't at all. Ooh. So our pal Travis wants to know uh, three things. He wants to know, what do you think of Slumber Party Massacre 2? Yeah, so we talked about this recently, actually, because you're more of a fan of 
Slumber Party Massacre 1. Like, that's the one you've watched over and over and over Yes, again. that's my go-to. I, however, am <laughs> all about that Slumber Party Massacre 2. It is... Oh, <sighs> it's so good. Amazing soundtrack. Great group of characters. Insane killer. Uh, it is like the perfect sequel in my mind. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love Slumber Party Massacre. But boy, oh boy, do I love everything about Slumber Party Massacre 2. <laughs> so if I could enter into a movie and just be like a spectator watching like the girl group playing in their garage, like rehearsing, that's what I'd want. That'd be uh, your uh, that'd be your your heaven. 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 That would be my Tokyo convertible. Um <laughs> Less of a fan, less of a fan of Slumber Party Massacre 3, which is weirdly dour yeah, after the other yeah. two. I do like it. I mean, I like that it's a change of pace. Yeah. But I like yeah. that it's a grunge movie. Yeah, it's a little grungy. Very, It's a strange <laughs> movie. Um, love them all. Great series. Wonderful trilogy. So what about his follow-up movie, Sleepaway Camp 2? How do you feel about that one? I would say that I used to be more of a fan of Sleepaway Camp 2. Mm. And that now I'm a little bit more of a fan of Sleepaway Camp OG. Nice. I mean, I love them both. I mean, that's a really hard choice to make. Obviously, Pamela Springsteen is amazing. She is what? She is maybe my favorite. No, she is my favorite uh, uh, slasher killer. That performance in particular, but also oh, in part yeah. three of any slasher movie. Period. Uh, she's an absolute joy. But I do love the vibe that Sleepaway Camp gives me. Of course. Um, of course. And of course, it has the iconic line, <laughs> eat shit and live. <laughs> I mean, I love the Sleepaway Camp movies. I even like Sleepaway Camp 3, which uh, I didn't like the first time I watched it, and now I like it. Oh, they're all so good. Travis also wanted wanted to know the story of how Brad and I met is now famous pretty much biblical, yes. biblical. Uh, but he wants to know how did jeffrey and i and how did simon and i meet so i'm calling this segment jeffrey and simon colon x-men origins <laughs> uh simon and jeffrey colon wolverine colon <laughs> x-men origins yes thank you how did we meet was it through our blogs I think so. I think that that's when we started interacting. I think it was because I started my blog and I, I did a movie thon like you do. Mm. But I knew of you years before then because of the message board that we both oh posted. Oh my God, on. this is so cute. Uh, we, we both <laughs> post on a message board that will go unnamed because I'm still there. You're not oh really, my but, God. but I'm no, still I'm there. Definitely not. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I've, I've been posting on this message board for, well, over 15 years. <laughs> wow. And you definitely used to post there more frequently. And I remember, I think you must have like linked to something you did on your blog because I think I was following your blog because of that way, way back when. Yeah. Um, so I think that's how I, I, I would just became aware of you and began following you. And then I think, yeah, I think like one of my, like my 21 Jalo marathon impressed uh, Brad and you. And uh, and then we started communicating. Ladies and gentlemen, the Nay Soon Tomora blog is still active as of right now. I will uh, have a link. <laughs> by by active, you mean it it exists, right? I'm not I'm, I'm not saying you you uh, write for it anymore or no. post on it, but damn it, no. it is not lost to time as some no. blogs have, you know, sadly gone. Yeah, I remember it was. Your your slasher movie thon. I remember reading mm. your slasher movie thon and just loving it. Mm. And I was like, holy shit. And sometime around then, we started talking. But yeah. the message board is so funny because it's not movie related. No. It's music related. At least initially. Now it's just <laughs> a bunch of nerds and hipsters. Yeah, it's a it's a support group for pasty al alcoholics is, <laughs> is generally how we refer to it. Uh, th that board became such a thing with so many hundreds of people that a bunch of us freaking left and started our own sub web board where it was literally 
the oldest of us, the whiniest of us, and like <laughs> the the ones with kids who had like settled down, and we were just like, man, there was kids at the other board are mean to me, so I come here. <laughs> and even with only like twelve active people, we couldn't get along, and so <laughs> I don't even participate there anymore. <laughs> it's so ridiculous. Yeah, we purged the um, the most ornery and uh, oldest oh, members God. of our crew. I mean, God, you know, so, most of us there are still pretty old. And folks, if you're at all curious about what the hell we're talking about, don't be. It's so boring. <laughs> oh, man, this freaking My Bloody Valentine re-release is so sick, bro. Oh, I think I think God. that's belittling of uh, my major social outlet in the year 2020, <laughs> but okay. <laughs> oh no of course they're all wonderful people and then it was but it was seriously it was years when you and i finally put two and two together where you yeah. were like oh yeah you were on that board i'm like oh my god it was yeah funny. i didn't i didn't remember it at first because i think i just sort of followed your blog separately it's from funny my initial encounters with it on the board <laughs> yeah so it took a while yay and now yay and now yay and now that's my jeffrey and richard fanfic <laughs> your shelves fall on us your shelves of movies fall on us and then we're trapped together and we, we're just <laughs> two skeletons <laughs> holding hands that's romantic thank you thank you so... actually that does sound like a genre lawn movie <laughs> <laughs> a, t- a toxic waste barrel will tip us over and bring us <laughs> tip it over oh whatever whatever living dead boys brad how do you feel about slumber party massacre 2 slumber party massacre 2 is that the one with crystal bernard and the guy with the yes guitar that one's a ton of fun oh. i like it a lot nice and uh how do you feel about another two another two for Sleepaway Camp 2. I have only seen that once, and it was relatively recently, probably within the last five years. Yeah. Was it Pamela Springsteen? Yes. And of course, it's got that uh, incredibly iconic cover with uh, the Freddy Glove and the Jason Mask. If I'm correct, you're a big fan of that one? Yes. I, I like it better than the first one. It's totally different in tone. They're almost completely two different movies right. from other planets but yeah i really like right. too i enjoyed it it's not one again that i i didn't see it when i was a kid sleepaway camp for me now has become beloved because of elizabeth because she <laughs> elizabeth loves that first sleepaway camp yeah lietta too uh, i think uh ladies just love that one apparently uh, which is is funny in a way because <laughs> I just you wouldn't I don't know I just want to pick it to be one that Elizabeth just loved, but she does like if I went in there right now and said let's watch Sleepaway Camp she'd say okay <laughs> and she'd be like don't you have to finish recording first and I'd be like Shh, I didn't even read that email <laughs> <laughs> the thing that's funny about uh, Sleepaway Camp two and what's funny about Slumber Party Massacre 2, they completely changed the tone of the series of both of their respective franchises. Slumber Party Massacre 2, it took things in a direction that's just crazy. And then 3 is like, no, 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 that was too crazy. Let's go back. Whereas Sleepaway Camp 2 made it possible for Sleepaway Camp 3 to be the way it is. So 3 is like aping two in its own way uh but they're both so different from the first one sleepaway camp two i mean that is just taking an early 80s idea and making it late 80s as hell and like completely changing it whereas (laughs) uh slumber party massacre 2 just takes it it doesn't take it anywhere it takes it to where only very specific people even wanted it to go if that makes sense um but yeah i love both of those sequels I still love uh, Slumber Party Massacre 1 more than 2, but 2 is like another film. It doesn't belong in the franchise. It's so weird, so you can't even compare them, Uh, but I love it. Uh, The zit scene makes me very uncomfortable. I am not really that squeamish, but for some reason when people portray zits in movies, they make it so horrific that it's like, get it out of my face. Just get that out of my face. Oh my god. 
As for Sleepaway Camp 2, that movie I love more than the first one. Um, I also like 3 a lot. I like 2 and 3 back to back. To back. The same thing applies. Like You can't even compare Part 1 and Part 2. They're so out there. Great question. Well, hello. Hello, this is The Doom Show. Happy special 200th episode. Uh, this is Tyler from Apologize the Podcast and Trapped in the Screen Room. Two shows that are, well rapidly inconsistent (laughs) um and hardly ever record anymore but i I will change that in the future but one thing that's always been (laughs) consistent is um hello this is the doom show which is the uh first podcast i ever listened to and it was actually the show that got me into appreciating podcasts and obsessing over podcasts and um you know, getting a little bit more out of the horror movie and movie geek community or movie buff community. And it's been a wild ride and I've discovered a lot of really cool films through the show and um, also have met some new friends through, you know, through the comment section, through the Facebook page, um, and including the Doomed Movie Thon like group, you know. So there's been a lot of really cool times to be had. There's been lots of cool peaks and valleys, including suffering through um, Soul Survivor. Um, But yeah, this has been a really cool time. (laughs) Okay, we shouldn't focus on the bad. We should focus on the good. Anywho, you know, throughout all of it, I've enjoyed the solo shows by Richard. I've enjoyed all of the really cool um, old school murder mysteries and locked room mysteries recommended by Brad. Um, all the crazy David Deco two um, nonsense um, from Jeffrey. Um, also, you know, um, R.I.P. and um, you know, many thanks to all the entertainment and commentary by Nafa, who's no longer with us. Um, but I find it really cool that we do have those episodes with him because we can kind of keep that piece of um, history alive. And um, even though I never got to meet him, um, I feel like feel like he was a, a friend even though i just knew him through audio and his love for rob zombie or mr robert zombie and uh william shackner in impulse so yeah so i've learned a lot of cool things about all sorts of cool movies from the show um, including other you know random co-hosts that have been through the years including scott from eurocultav.com Um, And how I started writing for that site, kind of through that podcast episode, weird kind of events. Um, And then Christian and um, Jose with his, uh, the two amicus movies on that one episode. Um, So it's been really cool. And one thing that I I wanted to spotlight before I ramble too long and break the servers from talking too much is um, you guys have always had this very optimistic and respectful look at all these you know, cool movies, whether they be something that's beloved, like Mario Bava, or something that's kind of frowned upon or usually trashed by other people in the horror movie community, such as Night Train to Terror. Here the engines go now! No, no, I'm not going to sing. No, I'm not going to sing. This isn't karaoke. You guys just have a, you know, an upbeat view of all these cool movies. And it's actually got me to kind of like, I guess, loosen up and not be so precious or pretentious about my movie choices. Just, like, kick back and enjoy the show. Um, So, speaking of, I'll let other people sit back and enjoy this show. But happy 200th episode, everybody. And I can't, 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 can't wait for 200 more. Um, It should be a lot of fun. And hopefully we might hear from some more Italian horror. Or maybe some kaiju movies. Maybe some creamies. Because I know there was that one almost creamy episode. But let's get some let's get some good creamy, 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 creamy episodes. I'm, I feel like I'm beatboxing. But anyway, uh, signing off. But yeah, keep it awesome. And uh, yeah, I think, I, I think I'm done rambling. Anyway, have fun at Hello, This is the Doom Show. Folks, Tyler... Tyler, you've been on the show many times before, sir, so I really appreciate you being on the show again. Um, I don't know what makes this episode 200 special. You called it special. I don't even know. We'll probably do like another four or five 200th episodes. The fact that we were the first podcast you listened to blows my mind, so we were the first and the worst, and I'm glad you have found other podcasts to help heal that wound. And of course, um, I eagerly await the return of Apologize to the Podcast 
Wonderful show. Wonderful show. Uh, and thank you for mentioning Nafa uh, and those kind words you said about him. I can't believe we actually have so many hours of his voice recorded. He was insanely funny to me and anarchic and made the show just completely bonkers. Sometimes we would sit down to record and the whole thing would fall apart just because it was complete insanity. Um, if you only knew how long the episode on uh, uh, Seven Deaths in the Cat's Eye actually was. Um, I got it down to a manageable length. A big part of that episode that did not make the cut was me having to stop and explain the plot of the movie that he and I just watched. So, based on how complicated the plot is for that one, I should have had him watch it a couple of times before we sat down to record instead of just... We watched the movie, boom, we're recording immediately afterwards because he was completely lost, completely confused, helping him keep characters straight and, and not confused. And then I got confused because that movie is really stupidly complicated on purpose. It's one of those Giallo movies where they don't want you to solve the mystery, so they throw a bunch of bullshit at you. And yes, it worked perfectly. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, his contribution to the show was great. I really wish he and I had 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 a chance to cover more William Shatner movies. I really wish we could have covered more Tampa movies because he had been in Tampa for so much longer than I have, and I've been here a long time, and he really knew everything about this city or would just find out super quick, and we just had so much to say about just the... Tampa is almost a genre in, a, in and of itself for filmmaking. <laughs> Looking at you, Punisher... With frickin' Thomas Jane. <laughs> Still, uh, folks, if you ever want to hear, like, the worst frickin' score for a film, watch that Punisher movie with Thomas Jane and, uh, what's-his-face? Hairpiece Man. What's his name? John Travolta with the frickin' flying. He's a pilot. Yeah, watch that movie and listen to the music. Holy crap. I love that you brought up Soul Survivors. Uh, I often forget that Brad and I ever did that episode. I thought that was going to be so fun, and then it was such a dog shit freaking episode. Bless your heart, Brad. <laughs> Did the best you could with what we had to work with. It was funny. And uh, we definitely are not respectful to movies. We hate movies. Yucky poo poo babies. And no, we're not upbeat. We're, we're downers, bruh. Uh, that's, that's kind of a thing with me, is I, I love being uh, as enthusiastic and as uh, hopeful as possible, which is why I've, I've enjoyed so many more movies than the average horror fan. I feel like, <laughs> I don't know, dude, like, I think I just love everything until proven guilty. I might have mixed metaphors there. Simon, did you have any, uh, any thoughts about doing the show after like, like 90 episodes? I know you weren't on all 90, but mm. you're on many, many hours mm. and hours and hours. Uh, well, just again, I, you know, I can't, can't thank you enough for, um, you know, inviting me on. It's really, um, you know, without kind of uh, getting too autobiographical here, you know, it has been like, like anyone's life, you know, everybody kind of goes through ups and downs and it has, it's really, um, it's been a real, you know, I always look forward to it, but it's just been a real kind of bright spot and a real, um, you kind of help to me to kind of, um, I don't know, not just kind of put, you know, my uh, endless hours watching all these flipping films and stuff to, to some actual kind of constructive use. You know, it's just nice to be able to kind of contribute something to a, um, you know, to a community. Yeah, yeah, I suppose that's kind of the crux of it. I could kind of <laughs> kind of rant and rave more to that effect, but that's um, basically kind of my overriding sentiment here. Well, it's been a treasure having you aboard. You are the treasure. I, I... Oh. I would never bury you. I'd just dig you up. <laughs> Maybe wash your coins. I don't know. <laughs> wash your goblet. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> wow. Oh, boy. But uh, yeah, man, this has been great. So mm. thank you mm. for your contribution. Oh, no, you're welcome. And yeah, thank you. Plus, I need anything that'll like give people breaks from my own voice. <laughs> Need I need oh. some uh, some salve, some Simon salve Ooh. on the the sticky stabby parts of my voice. <laughs> mm. Like you say in this uh, Alston, all that I need some uh, some Richard on mine. I think. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any like sea salt you could like gargle with? I know or swish with. Oh, that's I, the point. Yeah, I'm not I saying probably. you're swishy, my friend. Mm. Yeah, no, we probably mm. do. That's a good idea. 
Uh, before we go, did you have anything you wanted to say about the time you've served with, you know, it's shortened with good behavior sometimes on the doom show? What, what do you, how do you, how do you sum up? Cause you, I think your first episode was like episode 40 something. Jesus. I think I'm yeah. pretty sure it was around episode 40 something. Sure. Cause I remember we did uh house of the laughing windows first that was the first one yeah yeah oh my god so you know how do you sum up your your uh, experiences from hello this is the doom shoe well i'd say i'm still waiting for my parole hearing and uh if not that i will take the lethal injection anytime you're ready <laughs> <laughs> of course i kid i kid oh there's nothing more I love than inflicting these movies upon you. And through sheer will and I think length of exposure, uh, you have been Stockholm syndromed into enjoying them as much as I do. That is true. Yep. So I feel like I feel pretty accomplished. Uh, <laughs> so I can't wait to see what depths we get into in the future. Yay. Well, it's been great having you in this show. Yeah. So my well, favorite uh, thing is watching a film and going, oh, man, this is a Jeffrey movie. <laughs> and J Lietta will know exactly what I'm talking about. Like immediately, immediately. And then uh, when I'm doing taking notes for a podcast, whatever the film is, eventually something will happen. Well, she'll be like, <laughs> Jeffrey picked this, didn't he? And so, yeah, it's it's great what it's done to me, but it's really great what it's done to Lietta. So, <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I feel like that's an underreported aspect that Lietta is also watching most of these movies that I force upon you. Yes, absolutely. Um, I will never apologize. <laughs> <laughs> the turning point really was Nightmare Weekend for me. W once we covered Nightmare Weekend, my tastes in film completely <laughs> changed. That is the beginning of the end of me knowing what I used to think good or bad was. Like, that's just wow. And that's because I turned my uh, puppet controlled supercomputer on your brain <laughs> and fried it. Uh, so you're doomed. <laughs> That's why my driving is so erratic. You, t you take over my car all the time. Jeez. So, Brad, did you have anything you wanted to say about this milestone of ours? Somewhat similar on the lines of what we talked about, about what Dan said about us not being cynical. We started this. We were never, ever, ever going to be a weekly show. No. Ever. That was never in the cards. <laughs> we were going to do, it, you know, the podcast was going to serve us. We were not going to serve the podcast. Uh, we were going to do it as long as it was fun. No super scheduling as far as, as that goes. Uh, early on, I had to go take care of some things. And you had Jeffrey on. And before you know it, Jeffrey's on all the time. Yep. And then, you know, Simon. It's just, it's it's been really a lot of fun. I just said, hey, I'm listening to this podcast about Paul Nashy. Uh, I think you'd enjoy it. And then you were like, let's... Uh, we could do this. And I was like, no way. <laughs> yeah. But we did, you know, speakerphone Brad and the various recording options that, that got better and better and better. I've, I've really enjoyed it. I can't, I can't believe we're at 200. I guess there's shows that go weekly that make it a lot, 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 lot quicker to 200 than we have. But <laughs> it's amazing to me to think about how, again, we didn't have any kind of certain set schedule. Uh, there was the lost episode, the Krimi lost episode. Uh, <laughs> even after 200, there are still a ton of things that I would like to cover. You know, the super shows, I've really enjoyed doing them. The vibe episode, I think people really, really, I think maybe the, the early on, that was what people really dialed into more than anything was the, the vibe episode. We've talked about doing a sequel and I don't know, I don't know if I can or not. I think you just... You perfectly explained what the vibe was and, and movies that gave you the vibe so well. It's been a while since I really felt the vibe, to be honest. <laughs> uh, but no, I've, I've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed it immensely. Um, a lot of changes. A lot of people that, that were involved in the show that aren't here now. Nafa, Margie, 
you know, people that, that I miss and I know you do because you knew them much better than I did. But yeah, it's been a lot of fun. I love you. You know that. Oh, I love you, sir. Oh. I was thinking about that vibe episode. You know, it was such a strange thing because I have so much trouble listening to it because it it's my old style of of forgetting or just not knowing you could do noise reduction or not knowing to turn the fan off or you know just just whatever I used to do to make it annoying for me to listen to. And of course, we had speaker from classic, classic speaker from <laughs> Brad. And, Man. But people don't care about that stuff because they love that episode. I mean, that's episode three, right? Something like that. That's yeah. Wild. That is so wild. But uh, we we owe a huge debt to the Nashi cast. A little Troy, absolutely. Troy and uh, Rod really uh, got me fired up to talk about movies because they every movie they cover, they do it so thoroughly and. They they do so much research on everything. It, ju- it was just mind blowing, and I, yeah, we we were like, uh, "Let's do this!" And it, you listen to that that trepidatious beginning of episode one. It's so funny. <laughs> like, I mean, it was several episodes in before I stopped having butterflies in my stomach and worrying, <laughs> worrying that I sounded stupid or like a yokel. And I, I don't care anymore. And I, I, it's not that I don't care about the show. It's just that I don't, that part of it doesn't bother me Yeah. anymore. But it, cause Elizabeth, even, even years into it, Elizabeth said, are you, are you nervous about it? No, no, that was gone a long time ago. Yeah. I, I remember being terrified. Episode one, my voice is like almost two octaves higher. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, that was <laughs> the dead or alive. Yeah. You, you picked it. Oh, and it man. was it was it was great. Still, what a movie! But yeah, no, this is this has been great. This has been such a crazy journey. We've made so many great friends. So absolutely, I, I still can't believe people are listening. It's just insane to me. <laughs> like Amy and her husband Dan, they were when back when you could actually go out into the world. Because look how much that's changed. <laughs> When they would drive around listening to us, and it was like, why? Why would you do, why would you do that? Yeah. Uh, I, but I've, they did. I've heard that Carrie Frankenstein, uh, would, her commute to work was pretty long, and she would listen to us on the way to work. And I'm like, really? That's not... Tampa traffic is dangerous. We're annoying. Mm. Don't do it. Uh, but no one listens to the show more than me folks i uh oh boy it's true i make this show for me uh my co-hosts and then last but not least i make it for you and i could not do this without without brad and and jeffrey and simon it's just been unfortunately if i lost the listener i'd still just be here talking to myself people love the solo shows don't underestimate it oh my god i've got some plan it's gonna happen it's got to be easier in a way because you don't have any, you don't have to call somebody at six o'clock or whatever. You can just do it. You could talk Leetta into coming in and talking oh, about yeah. some stuff too. I've really enjoyed Leetta on the show, by the oh, way. There's more. We got, we got lots more planned. That's awesome. Yep. Folks, if you knew Leetta, you don't because Leetta is a, is a mystery, <laughs> but Leetta is amazing. <laughs> yeah. She's kind of the reason I'm alive. Also, she's the, yeah. she's the reason I'm alive. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't mind saying she's the reason I'm alive. <laughs> I had a suspicion. I had a sneaking suspicion. Yeah. It's true. Back in the Korean conflict, <laughs> we had to save my life. It always comes back to that, that police it, action. <laughs> it does. <laughs> it. Well, Brad, thank you so much for... Uh, for all of these hours and hours and hours of your life. Thank you. So reflecting on episode 200, it's just been something else. <laughs> Getting to hang out with, with, with Brad, Jeffrey, and Simon uh, on a semi-regular basis, having somebody to talk to about this stuff. Because uh, I think a lot of this comes from, at least for me, the early 2000s when... Other than some web boards, I literally had no one to talk to about movies like this. Uh, other than my poor co-workers and my friends who were not into horror at all. Uh, they had to listen to me just rambling forever at them. Eventually, um, Brad foolishly gave me his phone number and we just shot the shit 
for hours and hours and hours talking about movies and comic books and music. And then, of course, it always came back to movies, movies, movies. And hearing the Nashy cast and some other podcasts from my formative what's a podcast time of my life and, and thinking foolishly that we could do it too. Uh, <laughs> somehow we, we did it and we're still doing it after all these years. I find it really funny when uh, shows that have only been around for five years are on like episode 500 or something. I'm like, Ooh, so <laughs> we've been more regular than we used to because of all the fiber. No, we've been much more regular than we used to because of all of the fruit we eat. I think uh, now is the time for me to start reading to you from Infinite Jest by David Foster Wallace. So, <clears throat> <clears throat> no, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to read to you from a book. <laughs> So, yeah, that's it. Episode 200 has happened. I don't even know how it happened. I wasn't there. I didn't hear it. Folks, thank you so much for writing in. And to all you listeners out there, I can't believe you're here, still here. We have so many more episodes to go. But yeah, we're going to keep loving movies, sexually loving movies. I didn't want to sound like a neuter. I didn't want it to be a platonic love. So it's definitely a very graphic, sweaty, physical, quivering love for cinema that we'll continue to talk about on Hello, This is the Doom Show until we stop. Hello, This is the Doom Show is a proud member of the Legion Podcast Network. Please check out the other shows at legionpodcasts.com. If you want more of Hello, This is the Doom Show, check out doomedmoviethon.com or hellodoomedshow.podomatic.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at doomedmoviethon or email the show doomedmoviethon at gmail.com. We're also in the air. Look up.